in the 90s, when I got there, I thought, oh, here we are, you know, human beings make these places holy. No, it's just another dump, you know. Chinese made us park and put up our tents in some really awful place with, uh, with uh, all kind of broken glass and dog barking and garbage everywhere. It was really bad. So I was like, oh, I don't really came all the way out here. It's just the usual human fabrication. And uh, then I went to, to try to go to sleep in this tent. It was in the autumn. And at that altitude, uh, you know, 17, that's at 17, 16, 5, the kind of base camp, a town called Darchen. And, uh, and at sunrise, sunset in October, as the sun goes like this, the temperature goes like that, same time, down to below zero. And uh, although it was, you know, it was only October. And they, the Sherpas brought a hot water bottle and I'm huddling with, under like 5,000 foot parka, inside a double sleeping bag, you know, like closed everything, pitch dark. And then there's suddenly like, there's a glowing light vibrating up through the sleeping bag in the tent. It was so bright. I thought somebody was playing tricks on me and shining lights on my tent. I like pulled out all this different layers and stuck my head out the tent. Nobody was total dead silence. Everybody else was hiding inside their bag. There was about 20 people, 15 people. And uh, I said, what? The ground itself is luminous? shining through sleeping bags and three layers of things. So I went back in and it still did that, you know. And then I couldn't sleep and I got so totally energized. I was like, I was just like that. And uh, poor, poor teammates, you know, in their tents, like 4.30 a.m., 5 a.m., I was shouting, getting them up, it's cold, you know, in this magic place. I couldn't believe it, a place where the earth is actually luminous, you know. My Kailash. It's sacred to the Hindus as the abode of Shiva and Uma. And maybe in more ancient time, it was considered to be sort of the, what humans can see of the sacred Mount Meru, you know, in the Indian mythology. And uh, the Jains, it's where the Mahavira attained enlightenment. And um, the um, Bumbo people, of course, it's the center of the universe for the Bumbos. And for the Buddhists, it's where the mandala of Chakrasambara, the super bliss wheel Buddha, um, male, female, has their mandala always open, as they say. The mandala is always open in Mount Kailash. Whether you have a ceremony or not, the mandala is always open. Of the Chakrasambara deities, the mother tantra deities. I was really impressed by it, I have to say. Okay, so now we're in the Vimla Kitchen. How many of you here have seen Doctor Who? How many are Doctor Who people? No, you guys are smiling, but you never saw Doctor Who? Oh, my God. <laughs> Doctor Who is the oldest sci-fi TV series that exists, older than Star Trek, British. And in the old days, it was very low tech. And one of the bad guys, one of the super bad guy groups, which is still in the new, more recent sort of higher tech ones, BBC thing. Um, they're really very high tech now. Robots, or a robot race, but they have human brains implanted in them. Like Ray Kurzweil wants to do it out at Stanford in 2045. He wants to put all of us in robots. Because then we won't have any more problems, you know. Like eternal, we'll all be eternal robots. And he has all these wealthy people supporting him, this complete lunatic neuroscientist who's going to, and what it is, is he has a machine that, you know, when you're just at the point of death, it's going to peel your brain like an onion, and it's going to take all the patterns in your brain and plant them in the robot, and then you'll be eternal in the robot. And he says, don't worry, it'll be a soft-skinned biological robot. We won't be clanking into each other. <laughs> This is a real learning. These are the loony people who don't want to fix this planet, you know, so they're going to make something else. Anyway, these are called the Daleks. And in those days, originally, the Daleks looked like Hoover vacuum cleaners gone berserk. 
and they were going around and they had these things and they would go, exterminate, 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 you know, and then Doctor Who would deal with them. But the main thing, I'm sorry, I shouldn't get distracted. Doctor Who is a time lord, what they call a time lord. He comes from the end of this universe, from Gallifrey, which is where the time lords live, and he's the last time lord, except there's one bad guy time lord that he interacts with in some of the earlier episodes, and thousands of episodes there are. And he has nine lives and two hearts, and he sort of comes out through all these tremendous adventures, you know. But the point is, he can visit anywhere in time, and he helps beings on other planets and this planet. And his vehicle is a police box. It looks like a blue a London police box, like a phone booth, basically, from outside. But inside, it's huge. It's like has rooms and rooms and laboratories and swimming pools and mansions. It's like enormous inside. And Dr. Who, Dr. and Vimalakirti's house is like that. Vimalakirti has a house that looks like a regular house in the city of Vaishali, but then thousands of people can go inside the house. And, uh, they know, and then they, they bring thrones into the house from another universe at one point, which are 3,200,000 3, leagues tall, come inside the house. And then people, in order to sit on them, to listen to that particular teaching at that moment, they have to make their bodies 40 to 100,000 leagues. A league is about seven miles tall. Yojana is the Sanskrit word. It means the amount of distance that an ox cart can travel in a day, about seven miles or something, 10 miles. And then they're different, and they have to learn how to suddenly be huge. Like you suddenly change dimensions. and In other words, it's very sci-fi is what I'm trying to say. And it definitely comes from, at, at, at the latest, the, as a piece of literature from the second century of the common era, when it was first translated into Chinese. Western scholars make their dating of Buddhist Mahayana texts by basically when the first Chinese translation is made. And then they'll go back 150 years and decide maybe it was there for 150 years before it was translated. They'll, they have a rule of thumb like that, which is completely arbitrary, and they really have no idea. The Buddhists, Mahayana Buddhists anyway, claim that these, this does record events that happened in Buddha's time, and the Mahayana teachings are from Shakyamuni Buddha, but that he purposely suppressed them ahead of time, saying he didn't want them spread widely in India for 400 years the Mahayana teachings. But that, of course, is totally discredited by modern scholars because they don't believe anybody would have such a view of life and society and history that they would say something would be appropriate for 400 years later, but it isn't appropriate now. Although I, or for your group that I'm teaching, it is appropriate and I'm teaching you. But I don't want it spread widely. So I entrusted it to some beings. I think to merchants, actually, to the merchant class, which was his big class that backed the Buddha. The Brahmins didn't really back him. They were worried about the Buddhist monks competing with them. And the warriors thought Buddha, who was a warrior class, a king class, royal class, thought he was a traitor to his class. You know, He was like starting all these nonviolent monks wandering around instead of conquering you know, and having a good army and all this, like his dad wanted him to do. So. So Westerners won't believe in that. So you can take your pick of the different views. I personally agree with the Buddhists, and I think this Bhimlakirti is known. He's known as someone who was a wealthy layman of Vaishali in the Buddha's time from all the different versions of Buddhist, Buddhist history. But that he was such a person as this, and as recorded in the sutra. How many of you found on the website uh, the text of the sutra in English? How many? Only one person, two, three? Well, you've read it before, Bhimala Kirti, right? So this was a really popular sutra, obviously, in India. It was not particularly popular in Tibet, although it was known. Of course, they had it translated. It was very popular in China, Korea, and Japan. And various emperors and people wrote commentaries on it, and they were really fond of the Bhimala Kirti. Dogen, the famous Zen master, he very much respects Bhimala Kirti, although he complains about Bhimala Kirti. Uh, sometimes uh, that he wasn't respectful enough to the monks because the Vimalakirti is very famous in that he's a layman, but he's always teaching the monks, even the high enlightened monks within the Theravada view, you know, who are the Buddha's closest disciples, who are arhats already, meaning sort of saints. But they have a dualistic worldview, and Vimalakirti is always 
questioning them. And if you read the sutra, so not many, most of you have not read it, right, the sutra. So if you read the sutra, you will see that he's, he's always in dialoguing with uh, Shariputra, who's considered the closest disciple of the Buddha. If you see paintings or statues of Shakyamuni Buddha, there's two monks on two sides, usually in front of him. One of them is Shariputra, and the other one is Madhyalayana, or Moggallana, as they say in Pali. And uh, so he's very high. He's like St. Peter, you know, Shariputra, for the Theravada people. But for the Mahayana people, he's kind of the epitome of dualistic thinking. Uh, because uh, the Theravada Buddhism is, uh, but not only Theravada, there's 17 or 18 different schools of monk monastic Buddhists in the, in the, in the, in the Buddhist time. And um, they are all considered dualistic. And they're dualistic in the sense that they think nirvana is somewhere else. And they want to get away from this world and get to nirvana. Because this world is just too awful. You know, too much suffering. So they want to get into the other place, which is nirvana. And which is the absolute. Whereas the Mahayana comes and says, give us a break. How can the absolute be in a place that makes it relative? If it's not here, if it's somewhere else, then it's a relative place. It's a state. It's, you know, like a, with a boundary, a, a timeline. You know, in time and space, it has a boundary. So the nirvana can't be that. And then, 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 then the non-dualism begins. But I, th I personally think that Buddha withheld or restricted the teaching of non-dualism at the time that he did because he was dealing with what you could call a monistic society, which was the Vedic society in his time. Monistic means, you know, from monos meaning single. Monistic means everything is all one thing, you know. So like you, you can't, there's no way of, you're just the world, you're in the world and you're going to always be in the world. And in the Vedic world, you, if you are blessed by the gods and you're virtuous and so forth, you could become, go to the happy hunting ground and you could be an ancestor and then people would, would uh, your offspring would worship you. And if you were bad, you sort of dissolved back into the earth and you became food for the future generations. But you never, because they didn't have a very organized view of reincarnation in the Vedic period. But basically, it was just this one world, and you just try to get to a better position in the world through the, mostly the blessings of the gods, because you believe that the gods control things. And this made the ritual, the offering ritual to the god, the Vedic sacrificial ritual, very, very important, and the Brahmin priests very important, because they interceded with the gods to improve your fate. So therefore, Buddha's great thing as, you know, was he rejected that system, uh, but even before he was enlightened as a prince, he felt that didn't make sense. As he said to his father, when he left being the king, and he said, if, as a king, I should protect my subjects. But my subjects are not that afraid of being invaded or having a difficult economy or you know, having some problems like that, superficial problems. They're afraid of death. They're afraid of pain. They're afraid of all kinds of worldly suffering, sickness. And I, I want to help them with that. If I'm going to be their king, the Buddha said to his father, and the father said, oh, that's the priest they, and the gods. They take care of that. You just like run the country, conquer the world. And he said, well, if the gods are taking care of it, they're incompetent. <laughs> because people are freaked out and they suffer. And the gods, you know, so I think, they, I think we can do better than that. It was basically Buddha's rebellion against the religion of his time was that. He didn't believe in this ritual and this priesthood and all this. So therefore, that's why Buddha is celebrated for the discoverer of causation. His great verse is, Om ye dharma hetu prabhava hetun tesham tathagata hi avadat tesham chayo nirudho evam vaadi maha shramani. Shramani yeswaha, meaning that all things that arise from causes, what are the causes and how to terminate the causes brackets of negative things. That is the path taught by the great, the great dropout, Shramana, the great seeker. You know? the people translate ascetic, but he wasn't really an ascetic. He was a, he was a seeker. Okay? So, so then he thought, but, but because he was in this society where there was no idea of escape from the whole of suffering, nobody taught that you could escape all of suffering. Even the gods in the Vedic things suffered. You know, like in the Iliad and Odyssey, or in the Indian version, the Mahabharata and so on, 
the gods have divorces, their wives scold them, they lose battles with each other, they get into problems. You know, the gods are just like a sort of giant bunch of humans, you know. And so they are not immune from suffering, and therefore, in Buddha's view, they can't deliver liberation from suffering. And whereas, whereas the Buddha felt he discovered, he found the liberation from suffering himself, and he found he could deliver that, the method of doing that for others, he felt he could deliver. And therefore, that's the foundation of his movement, right? I mean, you all know this. I'm recapitulating a little bit, right? Because where we are in the Force for Good, the Buddhist Sources course that we're doing. Oh, hi, Saab. How are you? Where, where we are in that is we have had a bunch of weeks on the dualistic Buddhism or monastic Buddhism or Theravada Buddhism, which is very important. This non-dualist Buddhism doesn't reject the dualist Buddhism. Like, Buddha taught the dualist Buddhism, too, because some people need that at first. They, because the danger of the non-dualism one, if you're in a monistic world, where you think it's just all one anyway, you know. And the Vedic thing was that all the different classes in society came from the different parts of God's body. You know, the low class people came from his feet, his legs. The merchants came from the belly, the warriors from the arms and the heart and the chest, and the Brahmins from the head and the mouth. You know, the high priests type of thing, you know. But they were really all one body, you know, so therefore the high priests or the arms, powerful arms of the king could say to the low caste people, well, it's cool, you're God too, but you're the feet. <laughs> so bring us lunch <laughs> and wash the dishes. You know, because the feet are supposed to carry the body, so you get to work, you know, type of thing. So then the non-dualism can be very much confused with like it's all one, no matter what you do, so you don't have to do anything. Just be part of the group, you see. So Buddha, the dualist thing, emphasizes the individual and emphasizes that every individual from every class or every gender or every nation, because India was a multinational subcontinent even then, it was not just a single country ever, like it isn't today. India is not a country, really. It's many countries in, in, you know, knitted together in what bluntly one should admit is a leftover of the British Empire. You know, the Capitol buildings in New Delhi are a bunch of Greek-looking buildings built by a guy called, a British architect called Inigo Jones with pillars and the whole thing, you know, they're, they're not Indian-style buildings, you know. And the Tamil people, like I think when at one point during the recent liberated India, some brilliant politician decided that Hindi should be the natural, national language of India rather than English. And there were riots in Tamil Nadu and people were burning buses and whatever, you know, because they have a complete different ethnicity. They're a completely different nation, you know. The Tamils and the Keralese and the Assamese and the Bengalis there, and the and the and the Gujaratis, they're all different nations, different languages. I mean they're related. Some Tamil and the southern languages are not related, but they're pretty related. So so anyway, so that's where we've been with this sort of dualist thing. Now we're coming to the universal vehicle of Mahayana and the non-dualist idea, and Vimalakirti is a perfect place to start, not just because I did the translation. <laughs> from the Tibetan, which is closest to the Sanskrit that exists. And not just because it's the best translation, because it is rather good, actually, I have to admit. I was, I was too young to even understand. You know, when I finished the translation, I gave a copy to my mentor, my original guru, a Mongolian guy. And I said, oh, here, Geshe-la, I know you don't bother to read English books, you know, like translations, you know, you read in Tibetan or whatever. But you could put this in the library of the monastery. I translated it. And he looked, I said, the Vimalakirti Sutra. And he said, oh, he says, you're beginning to study that. That's good. And I said, well, no, no, I'm not just beginning. I translated it, he said. Yes, you're beginning to study it. <laughs> and then I said, well, no, I really studied it. He said, no, yes, you're beginning to study it. He repeated the third time. So then I sort of accepted that. <laughs> and years and years have gone by, and I read it many times to many students. And and it was printed by the Penn State University Press, and like a moron, I didn't ask for a royalty because I was young and I was commissioned, so I was, had a stipend while I did it out of graduate school. And uh, it has sold more copies than all the other books that the Penn State University Press ever published, ever, since then, since the 1970s. I never got a penny, but that's okay. That's quite good karma. And Penn State needed to have a good football team, so they needed to make money. 
Anyway, you had a bad coach, apparently. You know. It was a little bit of a scandal there. So, okay. So, but why, why it's particularly good is that, you know, the Mahayana literature, even though Western scholars think it's something all made up later in India, which I don't agree, but it is huge. It is really vast. And, you know, there are huge bodies of, you know, what they call, for example, the Lotus Sutra, or the Garland or Flower Ornament Sutra, or the Jewel Heap Sutra, the Ratnakuta Sutra, or the Prajnaparamita Sutra. They have many copies. There are thousands of pages. And it's huge literature. And the Vimlakirti, whatever else it is, it's kind of like an anthology of all of those texts. So certain chapters fit with this Prajnaparamita type, certain chapters with the with the flower ornament type, certain things in it fit with the Lotus Sutra type. So between all the, it has like a little taste of all the aspects of the Mahayana teaching. And besides being a precursor of Doctor Who, with this Time Lord, because you know, it's a reveal. Out. He actually reaches over beyond as many universes as there are grains of sand in 62 Ganges riverbeds. If you can think of a number like that, how many would that be? So he reaches to the eastern direction like that. He picks up the Akshobhya, the Abhirati universe of the Buddha Akshobhya, complete with Buddha Akshobhya in it. And then he shows that to the people, like in a miniature universe here. And the people all see the Buddha Akshobhya, they see the being studying with him. And one of the difference of the Abhirati universe is that the ladders from the heavens are always down so that the gods can come down and study with Akshobhya Buddha in the human plane. And the humans can go up and hang out with the gods if they feel like it. And they're always, it's always connected. Heaven and earth is always connected in that thing. But there are animals. It's not like Abhirati where there's no real ordinary animals and beings have a, are like angelic without gender. They have male, female elements in their bodies and there's no, and they don't eat ordinary food. They just have energy from the air. In the, that's the Western one in Abhitabha and they live in lotus blossoms and things. So it's not that kind of sort of surreal, blissful world. It's a, it's a, it's a delightful world and the Buddha is always present. He doesn't disappear like Shakyamuni does. But otherwise, it's made to seem very humanoid, very similar to the human world, to our world, which is said to be a rather rough world compared to the way some Buddhists have Buddha worlds. Because, you know, in the, in the Mahayana view of a Buddha, since the main thing Buddhas do, how are you guys doing? Is that working? You're, I see you stirring there. Everything's OK? Yeah, it's streaming there. Hello, streaming people. How are you? And. Uh, we're very happy Dalai Lama asked us to stream things, to expand more from Tibetan culture's base, the teachings about life and things like that. So we try to do that. And um, uh, what I, I was saying, I got lost. I forgot. <laughs> anyway, um, what was I saying? What? The what? Huh? I lost track. Anyway, so, so, so Vimalakirti is said to have come from there, right? That's what I was saying. And he shows that universe to people, which I think is as an encouragement, kind of. And then he puts it back. And then the, the beings in that world who have clairvoyant powers or have a little higher consciousness, they get frightened. They ask the Buddha Abhishobhya, oh, wait, somebody's taking away our universe and taking it somewhere. And Akshobhya just says, oh, don't worry, that's just Vimlakirti. He won't damage anything, not even one fish in the ocean. He's just going to show it somewhere and then put it back. Don't worry about it. And they have this really a preposterous, in a way, from our materialist perspective, idea about the ability, special miracle powers of enlightened beings. Really quite remarkable, which, which Mahayana Buddhism does have, you know. Like from Mahayana Buddha's point of view, all of us right here, there are like zillion Buddhas here. There are micro-Buddhas like Ant-Man. <laughs> There's macro-Buddhas. 
you know, the, the Buddha feels that all of us in this whole place is his body. And, but there are an infinite numbers of them, so they all do. And they're all working for us all. And they're frustrated that we don't really, we think we're like worried about getting from here to the heavenly rest cemetery in New Jersey, you know, at the end of it all. <laughs> That's what we're worried about. And you know, we think we're just this little being like we're running somewhere. But the Buddhas feel we're part of their body and they want us to realize that everything is fine, you know, which is difficult for us anyway. So we, we feel lonely and we feel we're separate from everything in the world. But I, oh, we've talked about that here. Now, I just wanted to announce just a couple of things. In the context of the course, um, I'm teaching a couple of more sessions on different Mahayana sutras in March. And then we're very lucky we're having the, uh, the abbot uh, of uh, Tashilumbo Monastery in Tibet, the famous monastery in Tibet, but, but of course reestablished in India now, uh, who's a Ladakhi. From, he's from Ladakh originally, Losang Tseten is his name, and he's an old friend of mine. And uh, he is going to teach here on the 16th of March and the 30th of March. And then Tom Yarnell is going to teach on Mahayana Buddhist ethics on the 23rd in between. And because I'm, I'm going to be away, I'm going to be in Bali and Borobudur. But I'm working there, don't worry, I'm not just relaxing. I have a group there and we're visiting stupas and we're going to be meditating. And then I'm back through the April, rest of April and May and carrying on through these different topics, okay? So I, but don't miss uh, the, this uh, abbot, he's great. He's really good. And we were really lucky to get him. It was a surprise, you know. And, um, and Thomas Yarno was also wonderful. Okay, so now the, now the Vimalakirti begins. Now, Vimalakirti is a little bit unusual as a Mahayana Sutra. The word Sutra means a thread, actually, literally. But in, and it has a little bit different meaning in Hinduism and Buddhism. And in Hinduism, like you have the Yoga Sutras, famous Yoga Sutra, you have that word Sutra and things. And there, Sutra means an aphorism or a string of aphorisms that... Um, you know, that are considered like, because the way Indians used to teach, because it was an oral culture, as well as a literary culture, but the way they would teach is you would memorize a bunch of aphorisms over a particular topic. And Buddhists also use that, you know, verses that you can keep in your memory, maybe 200 verses to cover a particular thing. And the reason you wanted these ver verses in your memory was to really understand them, you have to not only learn them, and listen to a commentary and think critically about them, but you have to meditate on them. So if you've memorized them when you're meditating, the meanings will come up in the mind. And then you learn from commentary and from critical thinking and engaging in doubt and analysis in your own mind. You've learned about the difficult points, and then you can really put your mind into it, but your mind just doesn't wander vaguely off. It focuses on the, what you memorize, if you follow me. And that, that shapes your, your concentration in a certain way. It's a very effective way of teaching, actually. And uh, sutra, in that case, means the sort of serious string of aphorisms that are often in, not comprehensible unless you learn a commentary, because they're very concise, so you can memorize them. And then you memorize them, and then someone explains them, and then you think about them, and then you meditate on them. Right? So that's one meaning. But in the Buddhist context, sutra came to mean a recording of the actual speech of the Buddha. So in a way, it almost means a discourse. People translate it sometimes as scripture, which it comes to seem to be after it's written, but um, at a certain stage, but really it's a discourse of the Buddha. So the Vimalakirti is rare because uh, the main teaching is given by Vimalakirti. The Buddha is at the beginning, Shakyamuni Buddha is at the beginning and the end, but then he kind of recommends people to listen to Vimalakirti. So it's the Arya Vimalakirti Nirdesha. So instructions of Vimalakirti, the noble, I translated holy in those days, I would change that today to calling it noble, the, the word Arya, the noble Vimalakirti teaching Mahayana Sutra, great vehicle uh, discourse, I would, I would call it that. Did you, were you raising a question? No, I'm just moving. So, so that's why it's unusual. And as I say, Vimalakirti, and this is why East Asian people liked it, as a layman, He's smarter and more eloquent and deeper and has more power, sort of magical power than the ordinary, than the monks who are already somewhat enlightened. But from his point of view, they have, they're a little bit trapped in dualistic thinking. 
So he's always after them. But he very much respects them as monks, though. He doesn't disrespect them. And that's what it's especially famous for, the Vimalakirti. But that's not really the main thing of the Vimalakirti. And some of the people in chapters 3 and 4, you know, I'm, I'm just jumping around and telling you because most of you didn't have a chance to read it, unfortunately. But in chapters 3 and 4, there are not monks, they're lay people that he questions, you know, he challenges. Uh, so it isn't only the monks that he's criticizing for dualistic thinking, he criticizes everybody, actually. And then toward the end, he meets the Buddha himself. He, he, everybody in his assembly, in his house, in his magic house, where thousands of people have congregated, and he says, well, now would you guys I'd like to all go talk to Buddha, who is across town in the suburbs somewhere, in a garden, you know? And they say, yeah, we'd like to see a Buddha. They're kind of tired of Vimalakirti, I think, <laughs> giving them a hard time. And so then he picks the whole assembly up in his hand and moves them across town, instant transport. And then he's there with them in the, in the Buddha's presence. And then Buddha asks him, well, you came over to see the Buddha, so now you're seeing me. So when you see the Buddha, what do you see? And so then Vimalakirti starts this long speech. It's quite marvelous. It's one of the unique moments in... Uh... So he says, noble son, when you would see the Tathagata, and Tathagata is a name for a Buddha, and the Tatha means such, and it means Tathagata, and the word Gata means gone. So such gone, or thus gone, sort of person. But such stands is short for suchness. And suchness means ultimate reality, the ultimate nature of reality. But it's called suchness because it's ultimate reality that is indivisible from relative reality. So it means like this chair or my nose or myself or yourself or the floor is such, meaning it's not quite itself but it's such as itself. And actually it's indivisible from emptiness, from vast space of transcendent nirvana. So this here is nirvana, in other words, suchness means. And the word gata means gone. And in uh, Sanskrit, in this culture, the post-Buddhism Indian culture, gone means understanding. Because when you understand something new about the world, about reality, you enter that reality through your understanding and you change, and your reality changes. You go into a different world, which is quite different from our idea of realizing something that we call it understanding. I think some of you have heard me say this before, but that in shows the sort of authoritarian nature of the European culture and Anglo culture that you understand. You stand under something. What? You stand under somebody indoctrinating you. You stand under some authority, do you see them, you know? And then because you, you accept what they say, whether or not you understand, you, whether or not you have realized it, but because they say it, you accept it. So you stand under them. So it's a different model of what understanding is. It's like you're the same, but now you just know that you're captured within whatever that person told you. That's our culture. That's why I ran away to India. <laughs> so I didn't want to understand various authorities in New York, here in New York and, and Massachusetts, where I was being schooled, right? I wanted to realize something. I wanted to experience something. And I felt India had a, a, a clue to that, which they did, they do. They have a, in the ancient Eurasia, India had the most advanced culture, definitely way beyond Europe or Persia or China. India was the place, you know. It was California, it was the most advanced place. You know, they had Jerry Brown, you know. And uh, they didn't have all this backward stuff, and banks and things that we have here. And the Greeks, you know, and clumping around, conquering people and things like the Greeks and then the Chinese suppressing the women and then the Persians doing whatever. So, so then I discovered this there. Anyway, so he says, so then that's addressed, but that's, uh, that's all about Tathagata. That's one of Buddha's names. The one who is standing in, in the non-dual world of samsara and nirvana is the same place. It's a tathagata. And thus addressed, the Lichavi, Lichavi is just like the New Yorker, you know. Lichavi was the, the nation that he belonged to, the city of Vaishali. Vimalakirti said to the Buddha, 
Uh, Lord, when I would see the Tathagata, I view him by not seeing any Tathagata. <laughs> so he's standing in front of me and says, when I see the Buddha, I don't see any Buddha. That's how I see him. I don't see Buddha. He says, why? I see him as not born from the past, not passing on to the future, and not abiding in the present time. Why? He is the essence, which is the reality of matter, but he is not matter. So this physical, seeming physical body in front of me, like you, that's not the Buddha, he's saying. That's not the, any more the Buddha than anything else. Which, of course, from the theory of the Buddha being the body of reality, is true. The Buddha is just as much Vimalakirti as this Shakyamuni Buddha, or the four, or the earth, or the tree in the garden there. Actually, he says. He says, he's the essence, which is the reality of sensation, but he is not sensation. These are called the five aggregates, you know, matter, sensation, conception, etc. He's the essence, which is the reality of intellect, but he is not intellect. He is the essence, which is the reality of motivation, yet he is not motivation. He is the essence, which is the reality of consciousness, yet he is not consciousness. Like the element of space, he does not abide in any of the four elements, earth, water, fire, wind, transcending the scope of eye, eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind, the six senses. He is not produced in the six sense media. He is not involved in the three worlds. He is free of the three defilements. He is associated with the triple liberation, is endowed with the three knowledges, and has truly attained the unattainable. The Tathagata has reached the extreme of detachment in regard to all things, yet he is not a reality limit, meaning some dualistic thing beyond reality. He abides in ultimate reality, yet there is no relationship between it and him. Because then it wouldn't be ultimate, would it? But yet he says he abides in it. So he, he feels one with ultimate reality. As ultimate reality, everything is one with ultimate reality, but he's not abiding in it. As it has no relationship to it. He is not produced from causes, nor does he depend on conditions. He is not without any characteristic, nor has he any characteristic. He has no single nature, nor any diversity of natures. He is not a conception, not a mental construction, nor is he a non-conception. He is neither the other shore, nor this shore, nor that between. He is neither here, nor there, nor anywhere else. He is neither this nor that. He cannot be discovered by consciousness, nor is he inherent in consciousness. He is neither darkness nor light. He is neither name nor sign. He is neither weak nor strong. He lives in no country or direction. He is neither good nor evil. He is neither compounded nor uncompounded. He cannot be explained as having any meaning whatsoever. And he goes on like that. No verbal teaching can express him. Such is the body of the Tathagata, and thus should he be seen. I, I skipped a lot more things he has. He's not an object, he surpasses all calculation, matchless, surpasses all measure. You know, he goes on and on like that. Such is the body of the Tathagata, thus should he be seen. Who sees thus truly sees. Who sees otherwise sees falsely. So that's a very, so basically he deconstructs everything in the scene around him and saying none of this, and, and, well, in a way, it all is the Buddha. So none of it is particularly the Buddha as opposed to something else being the non-Buddha, basically. So he sort of approaches the Buddha there. He, he in response to that, now, well, how do you see? What do you see when you come and see the Buddha? And he says, I don't see any specific thing apart from the Buddha, actually, is what he's saying. But, but I can't. Even saying that won't help. Because, because it's like the eye cannot see itself, you know. The eye is the same thing as its object in this plane, you know, something like that. But it's what he would say it's not a plane, etc. So it transcends language, you know. So then Shariputra feels nervous when he hears all this because though if you really follow this meditatively, basically nothing that you think of withstands analysis. And then you don't also know absence of everything with sense analysis. In other words, you, but you have an experience as if everything becomes like a vast vastness, like a huge empty space or something like that. But that in itself doesn't mean that that's what Buddha is. Buddha is the empty space with all the things in it, actually. So it's not just the empty space, but you have an experience of that at that point. So then Shariputra feels a little lost there. 
So he asked the Buddha, he says, and Sariputta has been doing this all through the sutra, this is toward the end, and he says, Lord, in which Buddha field did the noble Vimalakirti die before reincarnating in this Buddha field? Nowadays I translate that as Buddha verse, like a universe. I make a play on the word universe. A universe means something which turns around one thing. And for each of us, that's what our universe is. And it's turning around us, because we think we're the center of it. That's our delusory view that causes us suffering, actually. Because, you know, we think it's our universe, but then some other person thinks it's theirs, and they don't agree with that. So then we're, like, battling over whose universe it is. And there's so many other people, each one who thinks it's my universe, they lose out to all the others, you know. They, they can't overwhelm the other people. Everybody else's universe. So Buddha-verse, on the other hand, means it turns into enlightenment. It's a, it, you know, verso comes from turning, you know, like reverse, you know, reverso, vice versa, you know, to turn around. And uh, in Latin, you know. So Buddha-verse, everything turns toward enlightenment. That's I think, toward awakening, toward omniscience, towards whatever. So if Chariputra changes the subject when he gets too dissolved, he gets that feeling of dissolving, like there's nothing, he can't hold on to anything. He usually changes the subject, that's his favorite thing, Chariputra. So he says, where does Vimalakirti come from? Where does this guy come from? Where is, well, who is this guy? He's standing in Buddha saying, I don't see any Buddha? What's he talking about? So then the Buddha says, well, ask this good man directly where he died, where he died to re reincarnate here. So then uh, the Shariputra asked the Vichabhi Vimalakirti, he says, noble sir, where did you die to reincarnate here? And then Vimalakirti's usual obstinate thing, instead of answering Shariputra, he first gives him another little teaching on selflessness or emptiness. And he says, Shariputra, is there anything among the things that you see, elder, that dies or is reborn? He's saying. And then Shariputra knows, oh, oh, he's talking about an ultimate level. So he says, no, there's nothing that dies or is reborn. In other words, they're illusory. The seemingly dying and being reborn is all an illusion. Because Shariputra has realized a kind of nirvana. So then Vimalakirti says, likewise, Shari, Reverend Shariputra, as all things neither die nor are reborn, why do you ask, where did you die to reincarnate here? <laughs> Reverend Shariputra, if one were to ask a man or woman created by a magician, where he or she, you ask them, well, where did you die to reincarnate here? What do you think he or she would say? And Shariputra says, noble sir, a magical creation does not die, nor is it reborn. It's just an illusion, says Shariputra. So then Vimalakirti says, Reverend Shariputra, did not the Tathagata, the Buddha, declare that all things have the nature of a magical creation? And Shariputra says, yes, noble sir, that is indeed so. And then he goes on, so then Buddha has to interrupt, because Srimalakirti never will answer the question, because <laughs> he's always pressing people to see through the, their addiction to the superficial appearances of things as if they were really the thing. And their superficial experience of themselves, I'm the real me. And he's always pressing them to melt that down, to find their connection actually to everything else by melting them down, their false, falsely absolutized sense of self. So they will then find their relational self as interwoven with everything else, which is, it doesn't mean they're gonna find they don't exist, or there'll be a passage to a point where it seems like they can't hold on to anything. And actually the deep experience, visceral experience of that is almost like a death experience because it's like you kind of give up your feeling of, I'm here and I'm me and I know who I am. You, know? you, you go through that, you realize you don't know, and you kind of let go of that, and you could be anything, and you sort of surrender to that. And then what happens, of course, is you rediscover your relational being, which you always had. You never had this falsely separated one. And then once you've discovered that relational being, apparently cheers you up a lot, apparently. I hope so. Still hoping. <laughs> but in a way, we know that, don't we? Actually, if you just think even in ordinary terms. I, did any of you come to our concert last night? 
Oh, good. Good for you. Well, if there were good moments in the concert where you suddenly felt kind of exalted or lifted up or delighted or you had a feeling of joy, it was where you sort of got out of yourself as the consumer sitting there, I'm the subject, what's happening before me, and what, I, what do I get, who, what does it mean, and all this, and you sort of just, your breath was a little bit taken away by something really fun, really great, and you sort of lost yourself in your connection to that, and it lifted you up kind of thing, you know, or shook you around, or whatever, you know, like, like, a, like Iggy Pop jumping up and down, you know, like, like you know. and uh, doing his honoring David Bowie with it's all right tonight, you know. <laughs> That's very profound, you see, because if it were all Buddha's body, it means it's all all right. You know, like the non-dualism is sort of like that. But then you don't, you don't misinterpret that to think, well, it's all all right, but it sucks for me. Because I'm not really thinking that. I'm saying that, and I hear them say that, and I think that's fun, but... Then I'm thinking, wait a minute, am I all right? I have a cracked rib. I do actually have a cracked rib. But I'm very proud to announce at the age of 74, in six days, seven days now, it was last Tuesday I cracked that on my way to Los Angeles. And I couldn't laugh or cough for four of those days without agony. And now I can cough and laugh, and I can move my arm and everything, but I feel the pinch, but it's, I can move. Although if I go for a full sneeze, it's really tough. Like somebody, somebody left a cat here for us to adopt, and I'm quite allergic to them. So when I petted the cat, who's really cute, and of course he wants to make friends, because he's lost. Um, I petted him, and then I sneezed, and ah, and then I really, I haven't, at 74, I haven't kind of gotten past where I can sneeze, you know, when you have a rib like that. But it's, I'm getting there, I'm really pleased. Without any, I didn't have special anything. So, so uh, okay, so that's sort of, I jumped way ahead in the Vimla Kirti. Now, the Vimla Kirti begins in this marvelous thing, which is the way the, it's the posture of the whole Mahayana is the, is the problem. Now, it begins in a great assembly where Buddha is president. Vimla Kirti is not there, actually. And um, it begins with this, thus have I heard at one time, which I wouldn't translate that like that this way nowadays. I, I translated this 40 years ago. But, or almost, oh God, we have 40 years ago. I would, um, more than 40, 44 years ago. But now, I, that was the traditional thing, thus have I heard. Usually they say, just thus have I heard, and then, you, they, then they say, at one time, the Lord Buddha. That's wrong. What that first phrase is, evam maya shruttam ikasmin samaye, in Sanskrit or Pali. And it means, thus did I hear, I mean, exactly that did I hear, thus in the sense of exactly that did I hear, on a certain occasion. Samaya is an expression for an occasion. It isn't just time. There's another word in Sanskrit for time. Samaya is a special word for time that means a meeting of beings, you know, a bonding of beings. So it's like a special gathering or a special occasion. It's a specific occasion, too, and it's always put at the beginning of sutras, Buddhist sutras, because it means that this is being repeated or reported by a person who actually heard it from the Buddha. So it's a, it's a signature of the authenticity of the, what's going to follow. If you follow me? It's really kind of fun. So I would translate it a little differently. But at least I got it right. I put the at one time as to when I heard it. Not the at one time, but... A, you know, the Western people translate, they always want to do, once upon a time, the Buddha was somewhere. You know, they like it was a fairy tale. But it isn't. It's meant to be a specific discourse. And uh, the Lord Buddha was in residence in the garden of Amrapali in the city of Vaishali, attended by a great gathering. And it's kind of funny because Amrapali was, a, was like Marilyn Monroe, you know, the mo a movie star in this great city of Vaishali, a courtesan, they call it at that time, like a geisha. But she was high for looting. And Buddha had a, had a custom when he would go visit near a city. He didn't stay in a city ever. He would go inside to, to beg alms in the mornings sometimes, but like that was the monk's rule that they would do that. It's how they mingled with the people. They didn't want to be isolated. They weren't like monks who were afraid of crowds of people. They were very gregarious, actually, but they 
were renounced from family life and so forth. And um, so, but he would always accept an invitation for the main residence in the grove or the garden or some place of whoever first asked him, you know, stay with me, you know, or stay in my garden or stay. So there was a carriage race. It's not told in Sutra, but it's from other sources we know that. The mayor, you know, Mayor de Blasio, raced out to be the first to invite the Buddha, but the movie star was faster, had better horses, and got there first and said, please stay at my grove with your 500 monks, uh, your holiness Buddha. And Buddha doesn't say anything. He nods, and that means he's, come, he's going to go there. So then the mayor was mad, and, he, and the senior people in the city were like, we're not going to go study with Buddha. He's like hanging out with a movie star. This is ridiculous. He, I mean, he wasn't doing anything. He was there with 500 monks. But anyway, he was staying out there in this garden with this movie star. That's Amrapali was her name. And uh, uh, she's, she's a very enlightened person, actually. And it's in other sources. She, she's does not, not a big actor here. She doesn't have a dialogue, but she's a marvelous person. So anyway, he was in the residence of Amrapali, in the, in the garden of Amrapali, in the city of Vaishali, attended by a great gathering. Of mendicants, there were 8,000, all saints. So he had a big group of people with him. They were free from impurities and afflictions. Well, if you read through, you get, you get a very strong description of what the kind of ideal persons were. The ideal holy persons like monastic people, special religious devotees or nuncians. And then there's a much longer list of the bodhisattvas, how amazing they are that he describes. So I'm going to skip it, though, because of time. And then, you know, there's this sort of Buddha's in the middle of this place with thousands of people around him and all sorts of deities are parked there in the sky. When the Buddha would be present, teaching, there would be all kinds of invisible beings, to, nor, invisible to ordinary people, but they would all come and listen to him also. And uh, the gods, and even the creator gods, so-called creator gods, who in the Buddhist tradition tell people that they didn't really create it and they're not really omnipotent, so they can't be blamed for their misfortunes. <laughs> I really like that part. I always enjoy telling about that in, when I'm in Missouri and Mississippi and Arkansas, I think. <laughs> Because when I do, there's sort of a silence, a shock silence in the audience when God tells the Buddha that, sorry, I didn't really create it, and I don't really know how it works, and I want you to tell people about that so that when the terrible things, when their children die, when there's the terrible misfortunes, they don't blame me for it because I'm not omnipotent. And actually, Buddha, and they had fanatics like today, but they didn't burn them at the stake because India was more advanced, more tolerant at that time. So anyway, there's lots of gods there. And so the Lord Buddha, thus surrounded and venerated by these multitudes of many hundreds of thousands of living beings, sat upon a majestic lion throne and began to teach the Dharma. Dharma means both the teaching of the nature of reality and reality itself. Because as you know, those of you who have been here earlier classes, I hope most of you, uh, the Buddha's whole thing is not telling people to believe something. It's telling people to understand themselves and their own reality. That's the only way they're going to be free of suffering. And so dharma's highest meaning means actual what reality, what's real reality and the teaching that leads to the understanding of that reality or the realization of that reality. Dominating all the multitudes, just as the axial mountain Sumeru, the king of mountains, looms high over the oceans, the Lord Buddha shone, radiated, and glittered as he sat upon his magnificent lion throne. Now, now then the scene, I, I can't read it all but because of the time, but then the scene is that the young people from the city come to see the Buddha, 500 of them with their jeweled umbrellas. They have these parasols, sun-shaped things with all jewels and pearls and things on them. They're all wealthy, you know, it's very, because India was fabulously wealthy in ancient time. And they all come out to see him. So their elders are not coming. They're kind of boycotting the Buddha. They're mad at him. But the young people come and they bring their, with their umbrellas. Then they place the umbrellas down in front of Buddha in a pile as an offering. When they see him, he's so majestic and they're so moved, and they circumambulate him three times like that. When they meet such a great being, they do that. And then they sit down to one side to receive teaching. And the, but then he does this amazing special event, performance art, piece of performance art. And when I was commissioned to translate this, I had not read this sutra. And there, because I've been studying for a few years already with the Tibetans and even academically, for also a few years, languages and things. 
but I hadn't read this particular sutra, and because it's not a popular thing in Tibet. You know, they, they read it at high speed on holidays, but they don't really fuss over sutras, because they have the theory that the sutras were for the Buddha people in Buddha's time, who had a higher capacity to understand things, and that we have to use the things that have been collected from the sutras in an organized path of study to use in which the Tibetans did themselves and later Indian writers and things. They have the Tibetans have a kind of theory like that, which is probably good in one way, but also it's good to the sutras are amazing. So then what the Buddha does is this performance art, I couldn't understand what this was. He creates a piece of performance art where with the, with the magical power, he shapes this, which must have been quite a pile of jeweled parasols. Imagine 500 jeweled parasols in a heap. Lots of jewels and like handles and you know, I mean, you know, very elaborate Indian thing, you know, with pearls woven and sewed, you know, and little fringes and imagine it, you know, with the jeweled top and a fabulously wealthy kingdom these people were from. And a bunch of yuppie kids, you know, and they come out. And then he takes it and he makes a giant, I couldn't figure out what it was, then I decided it was like a planetarium, like a Hayden planetarium, like a huge dome, a visionary dome he makes over the whole huge assembly. There's this big, huge dome. And in the dome, the whole universe is reverberated, like if you would do a rose, you know, the rose planetarium. And you'd go and have a show where you would see all the galaxies swirling around, right? And then now and then they would have slides of like some ocean or river or a glacier or polar ice cap, or, you know, to show nature, you know? And so it's kind of a vision like that. He shows people and basically it's like the environment and the interwovenness of the world. He shows them. And he describes it here, you know? It's hard to describe because, you know, there are ideas of, you know, there are many suns and moons and stellar bodies, the realms of the gods, the heavens, and the dragons, and the goblins, and the fairies, and the titans, and the eagle birdmen, like in Flash Gordon, and the centaurs, the reverse centaurs. In other words, horses head and human body, called Kinnara, and Mahodaga is a kind of serpent type being, as well as the realms of, and all kinds of other things. And the, and all the great oceans, rivers, bays, torrents, streams, brooks, and springs. Finally, all the villages, suburbs, cities, capitals, provinces, and wilderness. And all this could be clearly seen by everyone. And the voices of all the Buddhas of the Ten Directions could be heard proclaiming their teachings of the Dharma in all the worlds that are reflected inside it. And the sounds reverberating the space between, beneath the great precious canopy. At this vision of the magnificent miracle affected by the supernatural power of the Lord Buddha, actually I wouldn't translate supernatural nowadays, I would say supernormal. It's actually quite natural according to his idea of the nature. Bayina, see you. Super, it's time go by so quickly, my God. Thank you for coming. Supernormal power of the Lord Buddha. The entire host was ecstatic, enraptured, astonished, delighted, satisfied, and filled with awe and pleasure, as you would, you would be if you had a sudden planetarium in front of you, and you saw all the whole universe, all of dimensions of it, and it reflected it. They bowed down to the Buddha, withdrew to one side, and gazed upon him with fixed attention. And then the head of the 500 young yuppie Vaishali, uh, whose name is Ratnakara, which means a jewel mine, dealt with his right knee on the ground, raised his hand, knelt with his right knee on the ground, raised his hand, palms pressed together in salute of the Buddha, like that, and praised him with the following hymn, and there's a marvelous hymn. And he says, pure, it praises him, you know, pure are your eyes, broad and beautiful like the petals of a blue lotus. Pure is your thought, having discovered the supreme transcendence of all trances. Immeasurable is the ocean of your virtues, the accumulation of your good deeds. You affirm the path of peace, O oh, great ascetic obeisance to you. And he goes on like that. But then he, he gives the teachings to showing that he's already very, very, already educated and developed and has deep insight, this young person. And he says, all these things arise dependently from causes, yet they are neither existent nor non-existent. Meaning they don't exist as absolutes in the relative, and they don't not exist absolutely in the relative. They, they exist in the relative, and they, but they don't exist in the ultimate in the way they seem to exist as separate things, each one a thing in itself, sort of thing. I mean, it's complicated to explain, but that's what he means. And uh, 
Therein is neither ego, nor experiencer, nor doer, yet no action, good or evil, loses its effects. Such is your teaching. It's a very good, concise teaching he gives. Then he goes on quite a lot with it. And then his last thing he says, you nullify all signs and all things everywhere. You are not subject to any wish for anything at all. Your miraculous power as a Buddha is inconceivable. I bow to you who stand nowhere, like infinite space. So he sort of sees through the Buddha. I mean, it's a, the praise verses are marvelous, you know. So then, then he asks this interesting question, which is the Mahayana question. And he says, he says, now listen, these young, 500 young people who came with me, they're all already seeking unexcelled perfect enlightenment of Buddhahood. In other words, to seek that, you have to imagine there is such a thing, that your consciousness is maybe like a sleepwalking consciousness compared to a fully awakened consciousness. That's already a huge thing, because we all think like the Buddha, I, the way I see it is the way everybody sees. We all project like that, everybody does. And you know, I think I know what there is. I'm confident of what I'm seeing type of thing. And I'm, my, you know, I, I'm unaware of my mind dividing things up according to my preconceived ideas about what they are. And I just think that my mind matches what is out there really in the world. That's our normal habit. So, so, um, so uh, the, Buddha, the Buddha is actually challenges that. And we can imagine there's a different way of seeing everything where you see it without being separate from it, actually, all the time. You realize that your mind is shaping it in certain perceptions, that it itself is something different. Like, I mean, just imagine this. We look at that wall, or you look at the wall behind me, or you look at me, or you look at the roof, or whatever, and you have two perceptions of it, actually. We all do. First, we see it the way we see it, and we think that's what's really there, that pillar and that wall. Because we think we, we really see it the way it is. We all think that. But then we remember, oh, in science class, oh, wait, it's made of atoms. And you know, you could x-ray can go through it. Cosmic rays come through concrete and everything. Right? They're trying to find a cosmic ray. They go down like 5,000 meters under the ground in a salt mine or something, you know, hoping that some other ray won't come there. So even it goes through the earth and through everything and then lands and makes a little jiggle on the top of a vat of some kind of mercury or something, you know, when they go looking for cosmic rays, right? They had scientists have these weird things, you know. So, it's, so on the other hand, we say, well, more real than that, than my view of it as a solid pillar is that it's atoms and it's mostly empty. Superman has, you know, x-ray vision, he sees through it. <laughs> Of course, he's, a, he's just in a comic book, but, or in the movies now. But, you know, I, you know, science has proven that. And not only that, if somebody dropped an A-bomb up on Fifth Avenue, the atoms in the pillar that looks so solid would go through a nuclear fission thing and they'd suddenly explode. And the atom itself is mostly empty. There's a nucleus and some protons shooting around electrons outside. And mostly it's empty space. So that pillar is mostly empty space with a little thing zipping around in it. But to me, it looks stupid. So we, I have a double vision of that as what I see, and I think that's real. And then I theoretically think it's real what the scientists tell me about the atomic structure of that thing. But I, I automatically am told that I'm incapable of perceiving that emptiness, that, that atomic level of it. And then the Buddha is challenging and saying, even the nucleus of the atom is empty. And the electron is empty. It has, it's not an indivisible thing. He, Buddha and his followers completely disagreed with the idea of an Indian science of the time and in Greek science of the time that there were indivisible atoms. Even atom will dissolve under analysis. They said even long before nuclear fission was discovered in the West, they said that, right? So, and we don't think we can see both of those. We only see this one, so we think that's really real. And yet we know there's a much more different really real thing, but we'll never see it, right? And then the anti-science people act like, oh no, it's just a pillar, you know, forget about it. They're, they're, they completely stuck on the pillar until a, somebody drops an A-bomb. Then they kind of get unstuck, rather, <laughs> harshly. <laughs> Sorry, but it's good for, luckily it's quick if you're nearby. So your own atoms dissolve. 
completely and they explode, you know, the chain reaction. So what, uh, what he's seeing, you, know, he's, you nullify all signs and all things everywhere. You are not subject to any wish for anything at all because he's, the Buddha has dissolved into the vastness of the infinity of all things and all ways and level. I bow to you, the miraculous power of the Buddha is inconceivable, I bow to you, stand over like infinite space. So these guys are already looking like that. They're, they want to become, they've imagined there is a being who has this full vision of things at all levels. Like if you imagine you could see it as a pillar the way ordinary people see it normally, you could see it the way scientists see it as having subatomic particles, and you could see it as invisible. You would see right through it as just what they call clear light of the void. as just pure light, like transparency. What they call clear light or transparency. You, you would see it all simultaneously at all these levels. And you would experience it viscerally in your body at all these levels. And experiencing it viscerally in your body at all these levels. And therefore feeling completely connected to it at all. And, and that all of it is your body. You can then shape others' perception to see things in any other way that helps them, which is the sort of theory, which is kind of unimaginable, but someone can imagine it. And so that's therefore, even though they say it's inexpressible, they spend a lot of effort trying to evoke poetically or dialectically what it might be like such a higher awareness that has all levels of consciousness available to it simultaneously. Uh, in order to help us imagine something different from what we are seeing. You know, we are seeing just a solid pillar, and we even feel challenged by that science that says it's a bunch of atoms. We don't, like in Texas, we would like send that scientist guy out there, you know, to be punished by Jesus or something. You know, we would not be into it. You know, because we want to hold on to our, you know, six, six shooter or whatever, you know. You know, and the ordinary people, not just in Texas, all over the world, there are still, people are like grabbing onto their property, their identity, their all these absolutes that they're stuck on. Their capitalism, their communism, their relationships, their, their, their own things they own, their own body, you know, takes precedence over your body, so they'll kill you, you know, because you're just, they don't know if you for sure what you are. You know, that's, these are all the, these misperceptions are the origin of all conflict and suffering from Buddha's point of view. Buddha's, Buddha's insight is like that. Anyway, these young beings have imagined there is this different way of being in the world. And they are striving to do it. But what they can't imagine is this, he said. They are already truly on their way to unexcelled perfect enlightenment, and they have, but they have asked. I said and, but you know, it, that's what it said in the text. But you should really never say, but they have asked, what is the Bodhisattva's purification of the Buddha field, which is the way I translated Buddha Kshetra in Sanskrit, which means a field, but like in physics, you know, you have field theory, you know, and this kind of thing. You have like a quantum field, et cetera. So a field doesn't just mean a plowed earth place, you know, or with grass growing in it. A field, you know, but, but the word here, I think really verse is better, a Buddha verse, you know. So how do you purify a Buddha? How do you, we can see how you change yourself, maybe. We can imagine that having a different consciousness. But how do you change the whole world? That's like way out there. We can't get that. We don't get it. That's what we want to hear from you about, they say to Buddha at the end. Please, Lord, explain to them, and presumably to himself, Ratnakara, the Bodhisattva's purification of the Buddha field. And the word purification, which I translate there, is correct, that's literal, but that can could have mean perfection. So like if you purified America, you know, it means what would be perfection of America? of the fantasy of this land of democracy and equality and no discrimination among races and genders and classes and everyone was equal, et cetera. And people would, people would of course be different and skilled in different things, but they'd all have equal opportunity and they wouldn't like rob each other and so forth. You know, the, 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 the dream, the American dream, the real one, not just the one of eating like rotten food from General Mills and, laced with Monsanto and weird like things that make you have Alzheimer's, you know. All those, it's not only killing the bees, it's killing us, this, this food system that is imposed upon us, crazy chemists. So, 
So how, how would you purify it? How would you perfect it? How would you make it re- be, be the best possible place it could be for all beings? How can you do that? Because a Buddha, you know, you can disappear into just infinite bliss. But that isn't what a Buddha is. A Buddha is infinite bliss. But then within that infinite bliss, in order for it to be infinite, it cannot exclude any one. And therefore, in order to be bliss, it has to be sensitivity. And in order to be sensitivity, since it enfolds every being, the perception of a Buddha, I mean, you have to imagine yourself here right now if you felt you were everybody who was here. But, and the way, only way you could feel that is by melting your sense of enclosed in yourself and your bliss being such that you were identifying blissfully with every being. So you realize, geez whiz, these beings are all sensitive. Their cells are sticking together one another, so their cells like each other. <laughs> like up and down their finger. Like even the, my cracked rib cell. Like still stays on the rib. It hurts because it's bruised and inflamed but it, from being banged, but it still stays on my rib. It likes the other part of the rib. It's just annoyed with me for falling on the ice like a moron. And, and so it's giving me like a poke. So you would feel that if you were a Buddha. You'd feel you were everyone. But then, and therefore, your sensitivity would realize that they don't feel like that. Like, for example, Bob Terman, he has a pain in his chest. He doesn't feel that that pain is bliss. He feels it hurts. And then, that would sort of be, it would be a, both disturb and not disturb your blissful field, infinite blissful field. It would not disturb it in the sense that, well, Bob Thurman is like stuck on his real rib being an intrinsically real thing and has an intrinsically real pain and whatever, and he's all stuck on that. So it'd be, it's, a, it's a more complex, there's a wonderful Japanese writer, Keiji Nishitani, who wrote very beautifully, I think, that the enlightened mind is not the simplistic it's all one because nothing is here, like vast space, or it's all one because there's a theory that says it's all one, or it's all different, or whatever. It's both all one and different simultaneously. It's a kind of non-dual oneness where it embraces duality. So, therefore, the, that bliss becomes a compassion in the sense that it wants to absorb that pain and overwhelm the pain in the subjectivity of the other being who you feel you're one with. You get it? I mean, it, it, you, it's just a thing to it. It's an you know, evocation. <laughs> Nobody can get it. It doesn't make sense. But in a way, it doesn't make sort of binary, logical, yes or no sense. But it's like you feel someone else, like you're empathetic to someone, but you see that they have the ability to rise out of whatever suffering they're in, and, uh, and, but yet you're fully aware they're having that suffering. So then you kind of map out the path for them to open their mind in such a way that they see from a different angle the feeling that makes them unhappy, and then they become happy. Do you follow? They have a path to, but you can make them happy because you can't, but you, you map a path for them, and you're effective at it because you're so blissful, you, nothing, you're like that kind of triple, quadruple axle skater, you just, you can triple around their knot of pain, you know, and then they can be carried away by the fact that you land without falling on your butt. You know, my wife loves ice skating competitions. I do too, actually, especially when they land. I don't like it when they're worried if they're going to land or not. Do you ever watch that sort of thing? That they, they're really beautiful when they do it, right? Okay, so, so, um, so, so therefore, since a Buddha is like that, becoming a Buddha has both the compassion side and the wisdom side. So it's like a teacher. The ideal teacher doesn't just sit and talk at someone not knowing whether what they're saying is helping the person or not. That's what an ordinary teacher like me does. But the ideal teacher doesn't do that. The ideal teacher has multimedia. When they talk about a jewel thing, they would have like a special effects that would show a jewel thing, like one of those like the, one of those Steven Spielberg's movies, you know, where they like show like a Crystal Palace or something, or some, or Doctor Who, the latest Doctor Who. The special effects are awesome, and it's sci-fi. It's really like fantastic. You know, you have that, or in the in the latest versions of Star Trek, you have that simulation room. What's it called? Uh, where they can create any environment, anything. They just tell the computer, and it creates this and that place. You know what I'm talking about? It's the something room. 
the holodeck is. <laughs> That's right. Thank you. You have that serious expression on your face, but you're obviously a sci-fi freak too. Oh, good. <laughs> so a holodeck. So you would, you would teach like in a holodeck where people would actually see these things at the same time as they hear about them. You follow me? And like the chairs would be teaching them. Actually, there is, did you ever see, did you ever hear a 4D theater? Have you ever heard of that? I never been in one, but my friend went to one in Thailand, actually, in Bangkok. <laughs> and he said, he saw some movie, and in the movie the heroine puked, and then there was a terrible smell that was emitted by the front seat in front of the person, like a vomit smell. And then, like, when some dangerous thing would happen in the spaceship or something, the seats would start, like, like going and felt like you get seasick in that place. And uh, that's 4D, supposedly. There's theaters that give you 4D, you know, visual 3D, and then the, the chair starts doing things while you're watching the film. It's pretty scary stuff, I think. I, but I haven't dared to go yet, but I, I'll get to one sooner or later. So, so how do you change the Buddha world? So then Buddha gives a long talk about it, which you all can read, where he basically says that you know, you evolve a whole universe with you of other beings to become a Buddha. You have, because you bring other beings with you like a whole universe. You bring them. And there may be multiple and alternative universes where you're not reaching, but other Buddhas maybe are doing that. They don't really get into sort of like picky things like that. They just say like you bring the whole thing. And he goes through a long story and finally he says, the Bodhisattva, you know, you know, he does, you know, his land is made of generosity, it's made of morality, it's made of patience, it's made of tolerance, it's made of diligence, it's made of concentration, it's made of wisdom, made of everything. You know, so the actual land is like that, you know, the, the earth wants to feed you itself, it's because it's just made out of generosity of your Buddhaverse. And it's perfect for the beings in it who you're teaching, the, the whole land is teaching them, that's what he says. And then he gives this final thing where he says, the purity of a bodhisattva's Buddha field reflects the purity of living beings. The purity of the, which you could read perfection for purity, but purity is literal. The purity of the living beings reflects the purity of his intuition, his intuitive wisdom, or his gnosis. I wouldn't use gnosis anymore, but I did then. The purity of his gnosis, or intuitive wisdom, reflects the purity of his doctrine, or his teaching. The purity of his teaching reflects the purity of his transcendent practice. And the purity of his transcendent practice reflects the purity of his own mind. So thereupon, and even the Buddha influenced Shariputra like Putra, like he wants Shariputra to be a, you know, his straw man here, you know. So he magically influenced by the Buddha. The Venerable Shariputra had a thought, which is the logical thought here, after this long multi-page speech about how the Bodhisattva, that is the being who's coming to be a Buddha life after many millions of lives, changes the whole universe bit by bit, and his mind being so pure, then the world itself, he transforms into purity. But then Shariputra had this thought, if the Buddha field is pure, or the Buddha verse is pure, only to the extent that the mind of the Bodhisattva is pure, then when Shakyamuni Buddha, that's his Buddha right here, was engaged in the career of the Bodhisattva, his mind must have been impure. Otherwise, how could this Buddha field appear to be so impure, right? Like, we've had Shakyamuni Buddha here, and there's other, like, Buddhas supposed to be running around, and how come the world sucks and terrible? Dark money, oil industry, climate change, world wars, yeah, Syria, refugees, well, what is going on? He's saying, like, then the Buddha, knowing telepathically the thought of Venerable Shariputra, which is kind of unfair because he mentally projected the thought into Shariputra's mind, made him think that critical thought, said to him, what do you think, Shariputra? Is it because the sun and moon are impure that those blind from birth do not see them? And Shariputra replied, no, Lord, it is not so. He knows what's coming. He's kind of used to playing this role. The fault lies with those blind from birth and not with the sun and moon. You know, they have brilliant light, but if you're blind, you can't see them. So in the same way, Shariputra, Buddha says, the fact that some living beings do not behold the splendid display of virtues of the Buddhaverse of the Tathagata is due to their own ignorance. It's not the fault of the Tathagata. Shariputra, the Buddha field of the Tathagata is pure, but you do not see it. Then the Brahma Shikin, that's the highest monotheistic creator god as far as other people think, 
although in Buddhism they don't think he is, but he's the most powerful of the gods, said to the venerable Shariputra, he, he jumps in and scolds Shariputra and says, I see it like really fantastic Shakyamuni's world. But then Shariputra stands his ground with, the, with God, and he says, but as for me, O Brahma, I see this great earth with its highs and lows, its thorns, its precipices, its peaks, and its abysses, as if it were entirely filled with crap. I don't know where I got the word ordure in those days. I was young and trying to be polite. Ordure. I don't even know what it means. <laughs> it was just crap, you know. Then Brahma, replied, then Brahma says, well, your mind is like that. That's why you see it like that. So then the Buddha, in, in, then Buddha does this thing where he takes his foot and he puts his big toe on the ground. He's sitting on a teaching throne. He puts his foot down like that, like a big toe. I presume right foot, I really don't, doesn't say. And, uh, and then he puts his toe down and then touch the ground of this billion world galactic universe with his big toe. And suddenly it was transformed into a huge mass of precious jewels, a magnificent array of many hundreds of thousands of clusters of precious gems until it resembled the universe of the Tathagata Ratnavyuha, which means jewel array, that's a, a certain Buddha in another universe, called Anantaguna Ratnavyuha, which means the array of jewels of infinite excellences, excellent qualities. Everyone in the entire assembly was filled with wonder, each perceiving himself seated on the throne of jeweled lotuses. And here, our notion of jewel doesn't serve us really because it wouldn't be that comfortable to sit on a jeweled throne. You know, they have like, we think of faceted jewels and be like a little bit sharp, you know. But uh, divine jewels in the Indian thing are like soft, like plasma, you know, that's like a diamond that's like a soft pillow or something, or a ruby that's like a like a fruit or something like that. It's, they have the, what they call this kind of jewel. So then, so, and they use jewel because that's what, that's sort of what's just a, means precious, a thing of value, you know. And they see themselves, and really what they mean by being seeing themselves on this jewel lotus thing is, they see themselves in the perfect place evolutionarily for them to learn what they need to learn evolutionarily to advance optimally in their evolution toward their own fulfillment in the bliss of enlightenment. That's really what it means. But they used to use the analogy of jewel, jewel lotus throne, you know. You know, like we think, you know, well, maybe I'll go on a retreat, I'll go to that Zen center and have a session, or I'll go to the Vipassana center and do Vipassana for a month, or I'll go to that Tibetan thing and have a retreat for a month. And then, no, I gotta work, I'm busy, it's like the, you know, I can't, this is such an imperfect place, I can't, I can't really devote myself to this kind of thing and really try to change my understanding. Later, maybe when I retire, I'll do it. Well, you know, we have all these ideas. So they suddenly see themselves in the perfect place for them to learn what really they need to learn to develop as a human being, you know. And uh, as a, to greater sensitivity, greater happiness, greater love, greater awareness. That's really what he means. And uh, so then Buddha said, Shariputra, do you see the splendor of the virtues of the Buddhaverse? Shariputra said, I see it, Lord. Here before me is a display of splendor such as I never before heard of or beheld. And the Buddha said, Shariputra, this Buddha verse is always thus pure, but the Tathagata makes it appear to be spoiled by many faults in order to bring about the maturity of inferior living beings. For example, and then he gives some examples about how different people see things and different beings see things in different ways. And then when everyone saw it like that, some people conceived the spirit of unexcelled perfect enlightenment, meaning they decided they wanted, really wanted to become Buddhas themselves to shape the world into the ideal way for all their loved ones. The 500 youths who had accompanied the young Lichavi Radnakara all attained what's called the conformative tolerance of ultimate breathlessness. That's a certain level of realization of emptiness. Very technical in their psychological thing of different altered states, you could say. And then the Lord withdrew his miraculous power and at once the Buddha field was restored to its usual appearance of sort of a semi-polluted place, you know. And then both men and humans, humans and gods who had subscribed to the disciple vehicle, that's the dualistic vehicle, thought, alas, all constructed things are impermanent. And then different other people had different insights. So that's the, that's the, um, the sort of opening statement of the paradox that we face in the context of universal vehicle Buddhism, where although Buddha never steps up into becoming like an omnipotent being, 
the Buddha is, reveals a kind of what I call omnicompetence in helping beings who are confused about the nature of reality discover the deeper nature of reality in the optimal, pedagogically optimal setting. You know, the best thing for them to learn, something like that. Actually, my wife loves this book. I like it too, by someone called Michael Newton. How many of you ever heard of The Journey of Souls by Michael Newton? How many, did you ever hear of that book? Some of you might have. He was a psychologist or psychiatrist in uh, Los Angeles. Who's, he's still alive, actually. I shouldn't say was. I think he's retired somewhere in Chicago. And he has some followers, you know, so there are people who still do that, what he did. And he used to use hypnotherapy, very mild, light, light kind of hypnosis, to help people remember previous lives, like, uh, like Brian Weiss, the more famous Brian Weiss. And, uh, but before Brian Weiss became famous, and um, although I didn't discover it before that, but he was writing this book a long time back, quite a while back. And then he happened in a couple of cases uh, where people kind of mentioned, well, but I was in that life, and then I had this and that relationship with this person who's troubling me now, which he was using it therapeutically, the way Brian Weiss discovered about the former lives, memories, whatever the ultimate meaning of what it all is. Uh, and, um, but then the person said, but then, you know, I died in that life, and I was reborn in another life, and in between the two lives, this and this happened to me. And then he became very fascinated by what the between state was like. And then he began to press people and coach people, you know, who he was using this uh, technique with to help them in their present life. He would push them to try to remember the between states, you know, the, what the Tibetan Buddhists called the bardo. And what he came up with was very, and then he made a composite of all the different people's testimonies in these sessions with him, thousands of them, a few thousand of them, I think, in his career. And he wrote his book, Journey of Souls. There's a lot of interesting elements about it. It's not the Tibetan Book of the Dead, it's the Los Angeles Book of the Dead, but, which is not the dead, the Book of the Being Reborn. The Book of the Between State, really. It should never be called the Book of the Dead. That was a misnomer originally by the first translator, modeling an Egyptian Book of the Dead, which maybe shouldn't have been called that either. But um, anyway, uh, the main thing I want, the reason I digress onto that is the main thing about it is that we, according to that description, everybody is reborn in certain like pods, you know, groups of people. And then in the between state, they go to this place, which is like, maybe like Harry Potter's school or something, rather than Harvard, or than a Platonic Academy, sort of mixture of Platonic Academy and Harry Potter, whatever the name of that school is, you know, Dumbledore's school, you know, in the castle there. And, uh, but not quite like to do it more than the They go there, and then in that they have a life review, and they look, and there's a library, and they can pull out a book of the life they just led. And then they can open it to a particular page, and they can see the scene, oh, when I was in eighth grade and I did this. And then say, oh, when I was in eighth grade during recess in 19, whatever it was, then I was a bully to so-and-so. And then they can see, then they, like Harry Potter, the page comes alive and they can be back in the scene. But then, if they choose, they can be the person they were bullying or themselves. And then, oh, what did it feel like the way I was behaving? Oh, that was terrible, you know. In other words, they go through a learning process of reviewing. And also, they're reminded of why they took that particular birth to learn what. You know, and, they are, and some of their pod mates who might be in the between life moment too will tease them. Oh, you were supposed to be a woman in that life because you have been mean to women for many lives and you were going to figure out what it was like and you were going to have also the higher insight into relationality that women have. And then you wimped out and you became a man again and you ran around and acted like an idiot as ever. And, and you did whatever and you didn't do that. And then, and then you get, then, then there's kind of like a committee. There's, not, there's no punishment, no hell. That's it's Los Angeles, there's no hell. You know, the worst you go is Tijuana. And, and uh, but anyway, there's a committee. And then the committee kind of encourages you to do whatever next you need to do to learn the next thing. And like, don't screw up this time. Like, go down and really learn that particular sensitivity lesson, whatever, deal with those people. Have a, you know, let your relationship ravel up with them in some way where you make up for whatever shortcoming you had previously. And so on. 
And like, they don't really have an idea that you're going to get to Buddhahood. But sort of there's a developmental thing. You know, they don't have the huge concept of Buddhahood that Michael Newton and his people didn't. But it's really kind of interesting. It's because this vision that happens in the Vimalakirti is kind of like that. What people see is that instead of complaining that I can't do this and I can't do that because the world sucks and like this and there's a bunch of idiots in the Senate and they're stopping everything and cut the budget for the school so I can't learn anything or whatever, one says, oh, wherever I am, I can learn whatever it is. Even adversity, even a problem, I can learn, this is what I'm learning. And it's very like Buddhist karma idea, although he never refers to Buddhism particularly. At some introduction, he mentions he, he, he didn't, he's not studying Book of the Dead, the Tibetan one. You know? he, he knows about it, the guy. Michael Newton, his name. So, so this, that's the upshot of this. And now everything subsequently in the sutra, all the teachings of Vimalakirti deal with this central issue, which is if the Buddhas are so powerful, not, they're not creators and they're not omnipotent, and they don't even have the power to make us enlightened. They would love to if they could, but they can't. Because you can only understand, you know, it's like you can provide a lot of reasoning to someone, you can try to reinforce their critical insight and their wisdom and their breakthrough intuition and so forth, but you can't have the intuition for them, you can't have the realization for them, you can't have the knowledge for them. Teacher can't do that. And, and because the, the, the knowledge is something, it isn't even verbal. Indoctrinating someone will not get them to have an understanding. They'll just repeat the indoctrination. Because the real experience, bye-bye, the real experience is beyond words always. You know? Not just enlightenment. You, know, you can hear about eating a you know, gala apple or a Fuji apple, how delicious and marvelous it is if you get it just right and some connoisseur can tell you and some guy can come and say, oh, we'll do this and that, <laughs> and peel it this way and that, and put it on a dish, and have a flower on top and whatever. But finally, when you eat it, it's indescribable, right? It may be great or not, but you know, there's no, the descriptions won't, then if you're a food critic, you'll come up and say something. But the actual experience of eating is only you can have that experience. And it has all kind of like characteristics and it's way beyond any description about it, right? When you do it, it just so even ordinary things, much less the nature of reality and the fact of which Buddha assured us when he attained enlightenment, what they call enlightenment, what we call enlightenment, when he attained that, he assured us that when you really know reality, you become a really happy camper because reality is just perfect for you, because you are reality yourself, and you, are, you, you have evolved to become a being who can really appreciate reality. You have a sensitivity, you have a self-restraint, you don't jump off and grab this and do that and mistake it, and, and you can learn even to restrain squeezing the reality of your experience into some preconceived and pre-cooked idea that you might have a concept of but you really just can be open to what it really is beyond any kind of concept or expression of it type of thing. So it's all about that. So then in that, there are, um, there's a number of things. The first thing you could say is this, is to imagine, you know, Vimalakirti starts to introduce him and they, they as a sort of a, a critical technique, but then they talk about how he's sick. But they use the word he's showing as if he's sick. He, at that time, out of his very skill in liberative technique, I translate it as Vimalakirti manifested himself as sick. And the literal thing is he tsultemba, he showed the pattern of being sick. Because of course they're already having the idea that Vimalakirti is beyond something of just sort of falling sick helplessly. He's manifesting being sick. He doesn't have to be sick if he doesn't want to. He, because he knows about the atoms of the germs or the bugs or the things about his body, and he, he doesn't have to be. But he wants to be, because he's, he's sitting there with the beings, and he wants to give a lesson about being sick. So he's sitting there, and then people come to visit him. How are you, Vimalakirti? What's going on? And then the Buddha sends, tries to send people to see him. He tries to send some monks, and then he tries to send some bodhisattvas to see him for a couple of chapters. And none of them want to go see him because he's such a hard case. You know, he never just deals with you. 
He's like, you say, how are you? You say, what do you mean, are you? You know, he's like, Clinton, what do you mean by is? What is is? Is there is there? You know, where, where's is? What's is? You know, he's like, does that, but he doesn't do it to hide some indiscretion. He does it to make us rethink all our, our constant dial monologue to ourselves as we describe our way through life and make our life fit to our description. You know, and not actually see things that don't, don't actually fit our description, by blind ourselves to them by pushing everything into our preconceived ideas, which, which, he's trying, which, they, which we have to break through. So he's, everyone tells a story to him, but then they say, some other translations they said, oh no, they don't want to see Buddha, or they hate to go see Vimalakirti. Oh no, I don't want to see him. No, I don't want to go. They never say that, actually. In the sense, they say, I'm reluctant to go. They can't say they won't go. Buddha's asking them to go. They have to go. They're all compassionate. They're Buddhists. They have to be nice to a sick person. They have to go. But they just say, I don't really feel like it. I don't know. I don't really want to go. It's like, you know, you come to the mountain stream on a hot day and it's flowing down there in the Catskill Mountains and you put your toe in and that's a big mistake because then you don't want to jump in. Then you're ready to go home and take your towel and go or lie in the sun because it's so cold. It's a shock. So they don't feel like when you have the shock of running into Vimalakirti's critical eloquence and critical wisdom about whatever they do is dualistic. And each one tells a story. Well, I was sitting there meditating, and he came and said, oh, that's not the way to meditate. And I was doing this, and he said, oh, that's not the way to do that. And all that he, and then each time, each one says, I was silent because he really had a point, and I learned something from him. But I just don't feel like it today <laughs> again. I'm going to go over there and say, how are you? Are you sick? What do you mean? What is sickness? You know, like, where, who's asking? Who are you? Where did you come? What's going on? You know, I just didn't feel like that. They all say. Then Manjushri, who's the Bodhisattva of wisdom, he says, okay, I'll go. No problem. I'll go see him. And I, you know, I, I can't really, I'm not as eloquent as him, but I'll go see him. And the minute he says that, Everybody says, oh, we want to go and hear the conversation between Vimalakirti and Manjushri. That's going to be really great. And we're going to go. And they're going hiding behind Manjushri's skirts. Because Manjushri is like the, he's actually, he's actually later considered, or Buddhists consider him the wisdom of all Buddhas. Like Avalokiteshvara, you know, is the compassion of all Buddhas. As a Bodhisattva, incarnated as a Bodhisattva, like Dalai Lama, Karmapa, and so on. And... Uh, Tara is the miraculous activity of all Buddhas, you know, manifested as a female uh, Buddha slash Bodhisattva. And um, Manjushri is, and, and uh, Vajrapani is the power of all Buddha, manifested as the sort of fierce deity Vajrapani. And uh, Manjushri is the wisdom, critical wisdom of all Buddhas, manifested as Manjushri who is a Buddha who is manifesting to be near beings as a Bodhisattva. So anyway, they go to see, and then um, in the beginning of the fifth chapter, and then this dialogue called Consolation of the Invalid is where Vimalakirti starts that kind of critical thing where he sort of dissolves whatever he thinks about, whatever you talk about, under analysis, which is the Prajnaparamita thing. You know, the name of the famous Heart Sutra, no eye, no ear, no nose, no this, no that. Because when you think you have this thing and then you really analyze it, it nothing will withstand, withstand analysis. And you'll have an experience of slipping into a sort of open space if you develop a high concentration on that critical kind of perspective, which can only be pumped up. You know, even in Zen, where people misunderstand Zen and say, oh, the whole Zen thing is you don't think anything. But that's wrong, because Zen, you have to generate this huge doubt, this great doubt. The only way you can generate doubt is to think both sides of a question so harshly and so strongly that you can't settle it. And then this gets more and more intense, and then you break through the sort of terms of the dualistic linguistic thing. But you have to think to get to that point. You can't just suspend thinking, suppress thinking, and then sit there with a blank mind and think you got something. You won't, because you've just suppressed it, and it's still there. The concepts are still all grabbing your experience totally, subliminally. And you have some sense of freedom in moments, but it's not a genuine breakthrough. So, so um, that, or you would, you know, because you need to, for that you need to cultivate the great doubt, you know, which the Soto and, Shirin, and Rinzai groups in Japan, Linji and Zhao Dong schools in China and Japan, 
or doing the same present parameter. They're, you know, their sutra, they say they're the sutra of school, but the transcendent parameter, transcendent wisdom sutra, is the sutra la sutra. It's a sutra that's constantly saying, constantly saying there is no sutra. <laughs> you know, we're not a sutra. There's no eye, no ear, no nose, no sutra. They always say that. This is the sutra of not being a sutra. There's a nose that's the non-nose and all that. Which means that if you don't really look too hard for it, it's a nose. When you try to look at it, your nose will dissolve under analysis. Those of you who haven't heard that before, or maybe shocked to hear that you won't be able to find your own nose if you really look hard for it and then meditate on it. You'll see right through your nose. So this chapter of five is like a kind of totally, especially the first few pages, about you know, how to console a sick bodhisattva, page 45 in this text. And I, the one that I sent you which is just a text without footnotes. I don't know if the page numbering is the same, but it's early in the fifth chapter. They did keep my chapter headings. And this has two kinds of selflessness. Your own selflessness as a personality, your lack of a rigid, fixed identity as a personality. And then there's the selflessness of objects, of things. Your body or your fingers or an atom, they're all selfless in the sense that they don't have a fixed essence in them. So there's a, that's the personal, or some actually almost ideal translation might be, I didn't use it here, I used phenomenal selflessness and personal selflessness, as other people still do, but actually better is subjective selflessness and objective selflessness. Selflessness of the subject, the personality subject, and selflessness of the object, of, of inanimate things that haven't got personality, that haven't got subjectivity and awareness. It's, but those are, it's, it fits, but it's in all inclusive. There's either subjects and objects, right? And they're both selfless. It's very important to realize. <clears throat> so he does that. It was just, so this is like Prajna Paramita. Then chapter six, called The Inconceivable Liberation, is like the Flower Ornament Sutra. And as, as uh, the Flower Ornament Sutra, which Thomas Cleary translated from Chinese, uh, we have some copies there in the bookstore, but it's a very big book and a little expensive, I, I agree. And I was going to put some portions of it on the thing for next week's class. I think I start with, uh, I go to Avatamsaka, maybe I go to Lotus first. I forgot which I go. But um, anyway, that chapter six is a mini version of that. And it's a really shocking. And when I teach the Avatamsaka, I will go back to chapter six of the, of the, um, of Vimala Kirti, because it connects perfectly to that, and it's a short form. And he talks about it himself. And then chapter seven, the goddess chapter, is just a lot of fun. It connects very much to what's called the Jewel Heap Sutra, it's a collection, and etc. And I think that's enough today, as far as me reading through it. You know, it's better when you've read it ahead of time, if you can. The classes can be better. And, um, you know, I can at least go on for hours with it. But I want to have some questions now of the different things I've talked about. Yes. Yes, Laura. What? Hi. How are you? You look happy tonight. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Oh, that's nice. Because it's, you, uh, it's being here and listening, listening to you teach this. Well, it's not me. Just I'm just like the to you channel for that. Channel it. <laughs> for people like Kitty. It's, it's coming through my pores. So thank you <laughs> that's very nice. much. Oh, that's thank nice. Oh, that's nice. But I love the story about Chariputra and the goddess. Oh, yeah. And I was trying to tell it to someone earlier, and I had it all mixed up. So could you, would you mind? Well, it's true. No, I don't mind. That's in the chapter eight. It's a marvelous thing. I tried to get Gloria Steinem to publish it in Ms. Magazine, but she, she's so anti-religion, she, and she insisted it was religion. I don't think of it as religion. It's a piece of literature as well as a piece of psychology. But anyway, at a certain moment where they really get down to it, where they're talking about, you know, they have talked in five and six. You know, in five, they all this no eye, no ear, no nose basically is the function. There's a little other element, but everything dissolving under analysis like transcendent wisdom, like Heart Sutra, is really five. And then six is, once everything dissolves under analysis, the nature of relative reality is like on the event horizon of this dissolved, that everything dissolves, which means there's no, there's no absolute thing in itself. Everything is all interrelated. Once everything is all interrelated, it's all malleable in supernormal ways. 
And that's the magical thing about the flower ornament, which we'll talk about either next time or the time after next. And you know that you know, there's a mountain, and you know, there's a universe in an atom, you know, type of thing, you know, in a sesame seed. There's, which is a very tiny seed, the whole planet in the sesame seed. You have to see the planet is in the sesame seed. Thich Nhat Hanh is always going on about that. You know, how the piece of paper has a rainstorm in it and clouds and trees and the environment, you know, because of the paper and the ink and the whole thing. He's always doing that. And that's the sort of the vision of the, that's the vision of the relative after you've realized that each piece of the ultimate dissolve, each piece in the ultimate sense dissolves under analysis, right? So then that's kind of the, what the, we would think of as the magical, illusory, but not just a total illusion, but illusory quality of the relative. And a person who's fully aware of that is like a function at the event horizon of dissolving towards space, dissolving everything, dissolving under analysis, and then things sort of melting into each other, whatever is beneficial for beings. It isn't just playing around with things and universes and doing magic just for the hell of it. It's doing things that, that open up other beings' minds by showing different things that, they, that astonishes them, that, that makes them see other dimensions to things. Is what is the purpose of that kind of inconceivable liberation activity and vision. And it's very amazing. We'll talk about it. I don't want to talk about it further. So then when that happens, uh, the Manjushri comes back to the question uh, of, um, of, well, you know, if everything is empty and no eye, no ear, no nose, then no suffering and no release from suffering, then why bother with what be, what's bothering beings? Like, and he asks him, like, how do you see beings? At the beginning of that chapter, he says, how does the Bodhisattva see a being? Meaning one who has seen through everything and you've seen it as all empty and illusory. And then he says all these illusory things. Regard all beings like a wise man regards the reflection of the moon in water. Or as magicians regard humans created by magic. Regard them as like a face in a mirror, like the water of a mirage, like the sound of an echo. All kinds of sort of unreal things. Right? And yet some of them are very funny, like the erection of a eunuch. <laughs> like, the, like the third rebirth of a once returner. Like the instincts of passion in the Buddha like the exhalation of, ascetic, of an ascetic absorbed in the meditation of cessation, where they've stopped all breathing and their inhalation and exhalation, like the track of a bird in the sky, like the pregnancy of a barren woman, like the unproduced passions of an emanated incarnation of the Buddha, like dream visions seen after waking, like the passions of one who is free of conceptualization, like fire burning without fuel, like the reincarnation of one who has attained ultimate liberation. So these are all things that don't, can't exist, you know, like a square circle. So then, so then, Manjushri, so that's how Bodhisattva, who realizes ultimate selflessness, consider all beings. And then Manjushri presses that, well then, how does he generate the great love for them? How can you love beings who are not real? Why, what is this? And then he says, when he considers all living beings in this way, he thinks, just as I have realized the Dharma, so should I teach it to living beings. Thereby he generates the love that is truly a refuge for all living beings. And this, the definition of love here is like, you know, the wish for the happiness of the beloved, the will to the happiness of the beloved. No desire, grasping, possessiveness in that. Just that the one you love, you want to be happy, that's all, right? And then, you, therefore, in a way, you have to be happy yourself to want someone else to be happy. If, you're not, if you don't know what happiness is, why would you want someone to be happy? I mean, maybe people do. Maybe they think, oh, I love ice cream or I love, like, McDonald's. So then you take people to McDonald's if, you, if that actually has made you happy, having those burgers or some ice cream. Actually, I'm a little bit stuck on ice cream, not burgers, but I, I don't like McDonald's. But ice cream I like. So that could be a distorted way of doing it. But if you, have, if you feel real happiness from realizing the nature of selflessness, meaning that you feel your interconnectedness to all the universe, and then that's a real bliss, then you, someone else doesn't have it. You feel like that. It's like the realization of personal selflessness alone is like when you experience that a little bit, and, and even, or even the tiny little taste I have, which is not a complete one at all, 
when you then see other persons with this Nalan thing in the forehead here and the looking of perplexity and, you know, like a kind of uh, like going through life like that, then it really grips you to see it because they're, it's, you know, they're just, they're asleep in this sense of feeling oppressed as they're just the one real thing here and the universe doesn't quite appreciate it and it sort of bears down on it and it's frightened of what the universe is going to do to it and it's like, where can they find safety in the universe and as if the universe, can, there is a place in the universe where they won't feel that way when really it's the way they are perceiving themselves that's making them feel like and you can see it, everyone's face looks like that, absolutely. As you know yourself, even at a, because this, are, this is not like the enlightenment experience is something different from what we do every day because we're these amazing human beings. So when you have a huge pleasure of some kind, even what people might call a worldly pleasure, you kind of get a kind of, ah, you know? It, it can be food, it can be a music, aesthetic thing, it can be sexuality, it can be sensuality, it can be just being in a field, it can be, a, be at the beach or whatever it is. And then you sort of see someone who's in the middle of some like rat race, and of course they look to you like, what's the matter with them? You immediately they, you see that. When you're like that, everyone else you expect to look the same way. You feel a little better, and then, oh, why are they looking like that? So that's the and, the, and this he's saying, the Bodhisattva who realizes ultimate selflessness has a sense of release inside that makes them see those unreleased inside as really gripped. So he, that, that, and that his love then is that, why do they have to feel like that? And I don't want them to feel like that. Because I, I felt like that. And I could feel how, what a release there is at coming to a different understanding of oneself. It isn't that something happened to them. You know, the athlete who wins the gold medal, they're like, yay, you know, anthem, you know, like a national anthem and all this, and the brain is like, oh, the next Olympic, who's gonna pay for my training? What kind of commercial am I gonna get the thing? Should I like what? Or did I take some drug? Are they gonna catch me? Do I have to take a drug next time? I mean, they're just completely worrying about the next, the next contest. It doesn't last for a second. Or maybe and they won't tell, oh, I'm so happy now, I want, ah, I want to have a drink. But they immediately worried about the next horizon. You know? And they feel they're supposed to, actually. And they're educated in our hyper-competitive society to feel that they should constantly be competitive. Don't rest on your laurels and all this kind of thing. You know? so, so in other words, we know that. From, so that's when you feel love. When you are happy, you feel loving of other beings. You want them to be happy. You do. And, the, and, and what this implies is that this realization of ultimate selflessness is a huge inner release. I like to say it's like, it's like that person who, who you know, they have, they, they've been taking like Zantac forever by the pound and having heartburn and all the thing. And then they go to some doctor and they go down with a periscope and go and they look down there and the doctor says, oh! Somebody left a forcep in there when you were born. It's been squeezing the cockles of your heart there, or squeezing on your stomach. We better get that out of there. And then they go in and make an incision and they pull out this dripping pair of pliers or something. And then you, you've had this thing like a plier squeezing you all this time and you went and you, you ate lots of ice cream and things to relieve this thing. But actually there was this crunching thing inside. And the person who realizes ultimate selflessness, it's, that the, it's like the inner crunch has been released. So they want others to do it. So they want them to teach them. How, teaching them doesn't mean they can do it for them. It means that he provide them the method to go in and look for that sense of absolute self of their own and fail to find it and understand what that failure means. And, and whether and whether cope with that and see that as, a, as an opening rather than something frightening and so on. I always felt so sad about Peter Sellers, you know, the Pink Panther, brilliant comedian, remember? Inspector Clouseau, he has a bump and he wanted to rim, you know. I love that guy. And then he freaked out, you know, he was one interview with him, he'd done something in Audi or something. But anyway, he, he, he was like, oh, I don't know, I don't have an identity. 
You know, when I, when I play a part, I become the part. And it really must be something wrong with me. And there was some shrink and stuff. Yeah, you better have better ego definition. You know, you, you know <laughs> we're taking him the wrong direction. And he's practically ready to kill himself because he has a deep insight. He's a genius person. And he realizes that, you know, your sense of personality is a work in progress. You're constructing yourself all the time. Actors realize that because they learn how to construct themselves differently in different settings when they play different roles. And we're all playing different roles in life, actually. Formed very much by our parents, of course, and by our teachers and by our upbringing. The voices we hear inside that we think is our real voice is often a kind of composite of some parent. The really neurotic one, you know, that they have all these case histories and Oh, that's the mom who told you you couldn't do it. Or it's the dad who beat on you and said, you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that. So they, I can't do that. So it's the superego, right, Freud? I mean, they, they, they know that well long before Freud, these people. So thereby, he, this is a beautiful passage, I say. I like this passage. Thereby he generates the love that is truly a refuge for all living beings. It's a true refuge because there's nothing grasping. It's love that is peaceful because free of grasping. You're not trying to get anything out of anybody. You just want them to feel that same opening, that inner release, that feeling of release that you found. The love that is not feverish, because free of passions. The love that accords with reality, because it is equanimous and all through. I don't know that word, equanimous. It sounds like a mouse. Equanimous, but it is a word. You know? In all three times, the love, the love that is maybe equal, it's good enough, I don't know. The love that is without conflict because free of the violence of the passions. The love that is non-dual because it is involved neither with the external nor with the internal. The love that is imperturbable because totally ultimate. Because when you realize ultimate selflessness and you sort of let go completely of sort of grasping, this is it, that's it, I got a hold of it, and that happens, then to your astonishment, instead of dying, you, you're feeling that that space becomes filled with things and it wells up with you, clear light of the void. And you feel really free and, and energized, and, and you, you feel delight and bliss and release and so forth. Anyway, the, the love that is, that is happiness, because it introduces living beings to the happiness of the Buddha. Such matters. You know, I'm skipping a lot of stuff, because you know, I forgot you asked about the goddess. So then after that, they have a great dialogue. And this dialogue, when the first, uh, second Chinese translator of this text, there are three of them, the second one who did the one that the Chinese people like, although I think the third one is best and close to the Sanskrit, but the second one was good, Kumarjiva, fifth, 400, around 400. And it was beautiful in Chinese because a, a Taoist uh, school teacher became his disciple, Sung Zhao, who was a good writer in Chinese. And when he read this particular dialogue, he said the, the, the dialogue to what in Chinese is called Qing Tan, the light conversation, illuminated conversation between Taoist masters seemed like chaff and blown in the wind or dust, you know, compared to this dialogue. And he flipped out. He got really into this Madhyamaka thing. Sung Chao did. And he translated it. So then, anyway, but I can't read it in detail. Maybe we can come back to it. So we really didn't need any other sutra. This sutra has it all. But what happens is everybody's happy. Everything's good at the end of this thing when they get... What is the root of the false concept? Baselessness. What is the root of baselessness? Manjushri, when something is baseless, how can it have any root? Therefore, all things stand on the root which is baseless. And this is like Buddha who prays to the Buddha who stands nowhere, you know? Everywhere and nowhere, you know? Because you're a free being, you know? You're not stuck in any particular place. So, so anyway, thereupon a certain goddess who lived in that house, having heard this teaching of the Dharma of the great heroic Bodhisattvas and being delighted, pleased, and overjoyed, manifested herself in a material body and showered the great spiritual heroes, the bodhisattvas and the great disciples with heavenly flowers, you know, petals of the flowers. When the flowers fell on the bodies of the bodhisattvas, they fell off on the floor, but when they fell on the bodies of the great disciples, the monks, they stuck to them and did not fall. The great disciples shook the flowers and even tried to use their magical powers, some of them had, to get rid of the flowers, but still the flowers wouldn't shake off. Then the goddess said to the venerable Shariputra, poor Shariputra, Reverend Shariputra, why do you shake the flowers? And he said, goddess, these flowers are not proper for religious persons. You know, they're not allowed to wear garlands or ornaments. You know, they're monks. They're mendicants. So we're trying to shake them off. The goddess said, do not say that, Reverend Shariputra. She's behaving just like Mimlikirti. Why? These flowers are proper indeed. Why? Such flowers have neither conceptual thought 
nor discrimination. But the elder Shariputra has both constructual thought and discrimination. Reverend Shariputra, impropriety for one who has renounced the world for the discipline of the rightly taught Dharma consists of constructual thought and discrimination. Yet the elders are full of such thoughts. One who is without such thoughts is always proper. Reverend Shariputra, see how those flowers do not stick to the bodies of these great spiritual heroes, the Bodhisattvas. This is because they have eliminated constructual thoughts and discriminations. For example, evil spirits have power over fearful humans, but cannot disturb the fearless. Likewise, those intimidated by fear of the world are in the power of forms, sounds, smells, tastes, and textures, which do not disturb those who are free from fear of the passions inherent in the constructive world, etc. He goes on like that. Anyway, then Chariputra is sort of put in his place, you know, about his freaking out about the flowers, because it is breaking a rule, but why is he so stuck up about it? Okay. So then he does what he always does when he gets cornered, he changes the subject. I think men seem to do that, don't they? And he says, goddess, how long have you been in this house? She is transcendent wisdom, who is a goddess, you know, the wisdom. She's Tara, transcendent wisdom, whatever you like, Saraswati. You know, wiser than, than, than humans, you know. And she says, then she tra tricks him again. She says, well, I've been here as long as the elder has been in Nirvana, in liberation. Shariputra said, a little bit awkward, he says, then have you been in this house for quite a while? Quite some time? And then she doesn't give an in. She says, has the elder been in liberation for quite some time? At that, the elder Shariputra felt silent. And the goddess continued, Elder, you're the foremost of the wise. That, because that was his like, you know, epithet. Why do you not speak? Now when it is your turn, you do not answer the question. She says. And he says, since liberation is an inexpressible goddess, I do not know what to say. And she said, and she says, all the syllables pronounced by the elder have the nature of liberation. She says, why? Nirvana, I can even use the word nirvana here. Nirvana is neither internal nor external, nor can it be apprehended apart from the internal and the external. Likewise, syllables are neither internal nor external, nor can they be apprehended anywhere else. You know, you talk, you know, where does it start? The word talk is a syllable. Is it inside? Is it outside? Is it when someone else hears it, listens to it, that it gets meaning or what? You know, it's like... We don't really know if you think about the word talk or you think the word talk before you say the word talk. That his psychologist guy, Daniel Kahneman, wrote a bestseller about how your brain decides to say talk before you know you were going to say talk because you're a helpless robot imprisoned by your brain. And everyone thinks, yay, that's great. <laughs> so therefore, Reverend Shariputra, do not point to liberation by abandoning speech. Why? The holy liberation is the equality of all things. And then he gets back on his high horse about the Four Noble Truths, and he says, God, is, is not nirvana the freedom from desire, hatred, and folly? And then she repeats, quote, liberation is freedom from desire, hatred, and folly, unquote. That is the teaching for the excessively proud, male chauvinist Brahmin saints. <laughs> but those free of pride are taught that the very nature of desire, hatred, and folly is itself liberation. This is the non-dualist thing, you see. But see, that's why non-dualism is a little bit dangerous to be misunderstood, because then think, well, I'll be as, as greedy as I want, I'll be as angry as I want, I'll be stupid as I want, and that'll be liberation. You follow me? It doesn't actually mean that. It just means that the energy of the void, the clear light of the void, the infinite energy of the vacuum, the quantum zero-point field, you know, that the quantum people have encountered, you know, too, which is similar to that, uh, that that is what desire the energies, these mental energies that are distorted into selfish greed, selfish anger, selfish confusion, and depression. Uh, the, the energy of that is actually nirvana, because nirvana is everything, always has been. That's the whole, that's the whole realization. Nirvana has always been everything. So, but never, I'll get back to that later. But... Uh, so she says, and she, he agrees, you know, he, he's, he, he's already a saint and he's aware of uh, Shariputras. He says, excellent, excellent goddess. So he likes that. Again, he was cornered and he likes her critique of clinging to the method and the theory 
after realizing the realization, which he has a kind of nirvanic realization, it's just that his nirvanic realization seems to be something separate from the world. But he realizes in a way, yes, that whatever is the world is just illusory and it's made of this thing. He's kind of blocking that. He's a smart guy. But when he, because he was cornered, he again changes the subject. He says, pray, what have you attained? What have you realized that you have such eloquence? He says. And then she says, I have attained nothing, Reverend Shariputra. I have no realization. Therefore, I have such eloquence. <laughs> Whoever thinks I have attained, I have realized, is overly proud in the discipline of the well-taught dharma. It's the, and that's what in Zen they call the demon ghost cave of thinking you're enlightened. It's deadly. It's really bad for you. Every guru who has misreated disciples and who has become miserable by trying to maintain themselves as a guru is the one because they went around thinking they were enlightened. And therefore, they couldn't accept themselves as having still some faults. And so they try to make, rationalize everything to be perfect. So then he again changes the, the subject. Well, do you, which, are you a member of the disciple vehicle, the solitary Buddha vehicle, or the great vehicle? In other words, one of the dualistic schools or the Mahayana. And then she says, I belong to all of them. I, I belong to the disciple vehicle when I teach it to those who need it. I belong to the solitary vehicle when I teach the 12 links of dependent origination. That's the solitary hermit Buddha, as I call it nowadays. And since I never abandoned the great compassion, I belong to the great vehicle, as all need that teaching to attain ultimate liberation. But then she goes on about how really the great vehicle is the main thing, and that's the great, that's the great love, the great compassion, inconceivable qualities of the Buddha. And then she talks about the eight strange and wonderful things in the house, which is all good. And then his last subject changing, which are very amazing, the eight magical things. Everybody's house should have those eight magical things, absolutely. If you, you should take that passage and put it on your doorway and try to you have a better sound system, you have a golden light, you have a better lighting system, and you have a better mental attitude about the house. That's what it should be like. That's what we want Tibet house to be like. That's what we want Menla to be like, like these eight strange and wonderful things. I should put it up on the wall of Menla. I'm going to, actually, next Tuesday. I should have done it years ago. So then finally, he changes again the subject. She says, Reverend Shariputra, these eight strange and wonderful things are seen in this house, this magic house of Bimlakirti. I mean, she's seen there. She just disappears out of nowhere. And she says, uh, well, who then, seeing such inconceivable things, would believe the dualistic teaching of the disciples? She said. And then he makes the final uh, uh, subject change. He says, Goddess, what prevents you from transforming yourself out of your female state? Now he's coming to Indian culture chauvinism. Some belief that people have that you have to be a male to attain enlightenment. And if she's so enlightened, how come she's a woman? That's basically what he's saying. And this is ancient Indian chauvinism, which is manifesting, which you find in ancient Buddhism too, as coming from ancient India. It's very much in China, Japan, in other uh, Confucian woman suppressing cultures, very, very much, and still in America. And we don't have an ERA here in, Bo in American Buddhism. There's no ERA, you know, Equal Rights Amendment. Couldn't get it through the Congress. <laughs> yeah, you know, but anyway. And she says, she, her answer is, Although I have sought my, quote, female state, unquote, for these 12 years, I have not yet found it. In other words, being a female or a male dissolves under analysis, too, she's saying. Reverend Shariputra, if a magician were to incarnate a woman by magic, would you ask her, what prevents you from transforming yourself out of your female state? And he says, no, such a woman wouldn't really exist. So what would there be to transform? So then the goddess says, just so, Reverend Shariputra, all things do not really exist. She doesn't mean they are nothing. It just means they don't really exist. They exist, but they don't really exist. Now, would you think what prevents one whose nature is that of a magical incarnation from transforming herself out of her female state? And thereupon the goddess employed her magical power to cause the elder Shariputra to appear in her form and to cause herself to appear in his form. She switched consciousnesses in the two bodies so that he was in her body and she was in his body. There's a movie like that where there's some weird crystal skull from Mexico and these kids have it and then they all they get transformed into other bodies 
the different people, the parent and the daughter. There's a bunch of movies like that that Hollywood makes, but I don't think they read the sutra. But they do that, and then people have all adventures as being in the wrong body, you know. But anyway, so then the goddess transformed into Shariputra, said to Shariputra, transformed into goddess, Reverend Shariputra, what prevents you from transforming yourself out of your female state? She wanted to rub it in, you know. So then Shariputra transformed into the goddess, replied, I no longer appear in the form of a male. My body has changed into the form of a woman. I do not know what to transform. <laughs> it's freaked out. The goddess continued, if the elder could translate out of the female state, then all women could also change out of their female states. All women appear in the form of women in just the same way as the elder appears in the form of a woman. While they are not women in reality, they appear in the form of women. With this in mind, the Buddha said, in all things, there is neither male nor female. Then the goddess released her magical power and each returned to his, her ordinary form. She then said to him, Reverend Shariputra, what have you done with your female form? And then he says, I neither made it nor did I change it. And then she goes on further teasing him and teaching him really about it. And as I say, I tried to get Gloria Steinem to publish this, but she wouldn't do it. And then finally, uh, Shariputra, you know, he never can give up. And so Vimalakirti has to say, Reverend Shariputra, this goddess has already served 92 million billion Buddhas. She plays with the super knowledges. She has truly succeeded in all her vows. She has gained the tolerance of the birthlessness of things. She has actually attained irreversibility. She can live wherever she wishes on the strength of her vow to develop living beings. So he sort of just says, stop worrying about it. She's the goddess of perfect wisdom. You know? She's a perfect Buddha herself. You know? So that's the, that's, the, that's the section you like. And yeah, that's a special thing in Bhimakriti. There's a few other things like that in the Lotus Sutra. There's a young princess. There's a whole sutra called the Sri Mala Devi Lion's Roar Sutra, where this, I think, nine-year-old girl gives this huge teaching to all these people. And then people are like, what is this? How can she know this? Some of them ask her, like, how come you're not a man if you're so wise? And the Buddha tells them to shut up, and she's really great. And she's there emphasizing the whole thing about everybody has a Buddha nature, and everybody is going to be Buddha, and the Buddha knows that that's going to happen, and so on. And uh, because the Buddha is a kind of, you know, the, the, Buddha, the Buddha's, and that's the thing for you to think about in the class, everyone, is, you know, Buddha, this is a key thing, about, and the paradox which the Vimalakirti addresses in many, many ways, which is that since Buddha was a bodhisattva but before he became a Buddha under the Bodhi tree 2,500 years ago, just our local Buddha, our Shakyamuni Buddha, there are many Buddhas, but that one, then supposedly he became a Buddha at that moment. But as a bodhisattva, he vowed he wouldn't become a Buddha in Nirvana until all beings were in Nirvana with him as well. So he wouldn't leave any being behind in suffering. But we feel we are left behind, we are suffering. Did he break his bodhisattva vow? Or how does he fulfill his bodhisattva vow? How does he do that? This is the question I want to leave you with at the end of the day. And we didn't, we went on, you asked me that question, so then I went on too late. And we didn't meditate, so you're going to have to meditate on your own at home. Those of you in the, whoever you are there, in this dream world, and uh, you all are going to have to do that. I'm sorry, but it's just, it's just so, it's, it's so wonderful, the whole thing. I'm sorry, I like it. I'm going to be in trouble with my wife, though, who wants me to take her home. And I wasn't supposed to go past 9 o'clock. And I hope it's not raining out. Thank you all very much. See you next Wednesday, not Tuesday. The day was only the Tuesday. I can recommend tomorrow, if, especially you who went to the concert, the Tibetan lady who does these wonderful chants and songs, traditional, and as well as those kind of more modern adapted things that, which she did more in the Carnegie concert. And she teaches the Tara mantra and this and that. She's performing here to, uh, tomorrow night. So I gave her my night, my Wednesday night. I had to move a day early. So that, because she has to go back to Switzerland, I thought it would be good for the, our Sangha, for our community to enjoy Dakchen Sakya, this great uh, singer, uh, wonderful person from, who lives in the, you know, the, the Swiss people and the Canadian people very, very kindly back in the 60s when the Tibetans came out and a mass flood of refugees into India from the Chinese persecution, when the Dalai Lama came out, 
they took a big, made big settlements in Switzerland and children's schools and things. And the Canadians then, a little bit later, they made, they brought about 2,000 Tibetans, and now there's quite a good community in, in Canada. And now finally we caught up in the A, starting in the 80s and 90s, and we have like a huge number of Tibetans in Queens. We have them there with Eddie Murphy in Queens. You know. Remember Eddie Murphy in Queens? He went to Queens to find a queen. They have a lot of Tibetan queens there. <laughs> okay, good night everybody. Thank you.